Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third NCI Intersect Showcase uh, on Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in Cancer Research. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of countries throughout Australia, their diver diversity, histories, knowledge, and their continuing connections to land and community. We pay respect to all Australian Indigenous peoples, their cultures, and their elders, past, present, and emerging. So I'm David Chalmers. I'm a researcher in medicinal chemistry, uh, drug development, and I've got an interest in artificial intelligence. I'm located at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we've got a, a, a great range of, uh, of fascinating speakers that we'll have for you today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to pass you first across to uh, Professor Sean Smith, Sean Smith, who's director of the NCI. Thank you, David. Uh, so a very warm welcome to all of our participants in this webinar from all around the world, uh, particularly Australia. And um, uh, it's a real pleasure for NCI to be a co-organiser in this event uh, together with Intersect Australia. Um, I particularly also wanted to thank our international speakers for very generously donating their time and their considerable expertise. Uh, Doctors Couch and Jewel from um, <coughs> NCI uh, and uh, Argonne, respectively. Uh, Professor Kapati Kramer from uh, Colorado and Professor Fred Connor from Arkansas. Um, it has been an uh, interesting. Um, Actually, let me clarify a little bit of potential confusion. There's two NCIs involved today. Uh, NCI Australia is the National Computational Infrastructure. It's effectively the National Supercomputing Facility here in Australia. Uh, the other NCI is the one that uh, Jennifer Couch is speaking from, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, so NCI Australia has been partnering with Intersect Australia um, for three years now in a fairly wide ranging collaborative uh, effort to uh, deliver upskilling activities for our user communities in Australia. Um, that spans across um, a range of uh, uh, specific training course activities. Uh, it also includes uh, collaborative graduate level uh, courses in different subjects that we've run across three years now. Uh, and this particular event is, is a, a a special event that we do once each year. Uh, so it's our pleasure to, to partner with Intersect in this activity. Uh, I also did want to thank uh, Dr. May Yun Chang Smith for doing most of the heavy lifting in pulling all of this together, um, together with this, the technical support from the colleagues at Intersect. And thank you to Dr. David Chalmers for moderating. So look, with that, I will pass across to my uh, fellow CEO, Satish Nair at Intersect Australia. Satish, over to you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to today's showcase. My name is Sadish Nair, and I'm the CEO at Intersect Australia, a co-host of today's event. Intersect is an organization founded by Australian universities, and for the past 15 years, we have been providing training, education, consultancy, and innovative digital technology to support research. Today's showcase forms part of a series of educational sessions that were started about two years ago through a collaboration between NCI and Intersect. It was focused, uh, provided to provide focused education for graduate level education uh, and early career researchers. The four presentations today will showcase state of art research activity aimed at enhancing cancer's research by integrating artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques. I would like to thank the speakers for their time in sharing the knowledge, cutting edge research and raising awareness in this exciting field, which holds a lot of potential for science and for the health of the community. And also a special thanks to Dr. Mayun Chang Smith for, from Intersect for her work in organizing this event. We look forward to co-hosting more presentation for the research community in the future. I'll not take any more time and hand over the floor back to Dr. David Chalmers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Satish. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, give you some housekeeping rules regarding the, the sessions today. So we've got four high profile speakers who are coming from uh, four different time zones across the US. 
Uh, each speaker will give a 50 minute presentation uh, followed by 10 minutes uh, for a Q&A session after that. At the completion of the session, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion where all four members uh, of the, the sessions, uh, will, all four speakers from the sessions will, uh, will have a Q&A uh, session and a discussion among themselves, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to, to speak to them and, and raise questions with them at that point. So during the presentation, if you have questions for the speaker, uh, please enter it into the, the Q&A box uh, the, down the bottom of your Zoom session. Um, and at, uh, at the end of the, the session, I will, I will ask uh, the questions of the speakers. Uh, at the end of the session, we might have a chance for um, uh, questions to be asked directly. If you wish to do that, uh, please use the raise hand tab on the Zoom session and uh, then uh, you'll be will be able to turn your microphone uh, turn your microphone on and and speak when uh, your name is said. When you've uh, finished with your question, please lower your hand. So, without any more um, delay, we'll move on and speak to our first speaker this morning. Uh, we'll hear from our first speaker this morning. It gives uh, me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Couch. Uh, she's from the, the National Cancer Institute AI Working Group, which identifies and prioritizes cancer research areas that can most benefit from AI methods. She works with colleagues across the NIH and other parts of the US government and international groups, industry and academia to coordinate efforts and build programs at the intersection of biomedical research and AI. This work includes developing and adapting new methods, uh, creating training opportunities and identifying and addressing ethical issues. Uh, Dr. Couch has branded the NCI and NIH supports research development of enabling technologies and methodologies for structural biology, biophysical characterization, bioinformatics, computational biology, mathematical modeling, data science, citizen science and crowdsourcing methods and others. So uh, please, uh, I guess, uh, uh, pay attention and uh, Jennifer will give us her presentation now. Thanks very much. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Chalmers. And, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me here tonight or this morning. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you all here in the rather convenient virtual space, although I'd love to be there with you all. Um, I'm from the other NCI, as was introduced earlier. That's the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the 27 institutes and centers from the um, National Institutes of Health in the US. And um, that means we're the largest funder of cancer research in the world. Um, and so that means a whole heck of a lot of um, cancer AI. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen here. Let's see. No, wrong screen again. No, I'm. You guys are seeing the right screen, right? That's that's the correct screen. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Second time's a charm. All right. Um. So. I just um. I want to talk you through here in the next fifty minutes or so um, how the National Cancer Institute views AI and cancer research. Highlight some of our programs and some of our individual projects, and maybe touch on some of the big challenges and opportunities for artificial intelligence and cancer. I'll talk a little bit about upcoming projects, including some plans for um, what we're calling an AI accelerator, and then um, touch on how all this impacts and is impacted by things like training, inclusivity, ethics. And I'll show just a little bit about policy. There's a whole lot more about policy, but um, if you want to read up on that, um, I'll, I'll give you some links. Um, cancer AI is an extremely fast moving space. Um, and so that, that policy space and the scientific opportunities are changing really, really rapidly. So um, I know this audience is familiar with diagrams like this, but just to kind of put us all on the same page and let you know where I'm coming from. 
Um, the term artificial intelligence um, for us is the big umbrella term here. It's the term for computational techniques that enable machines to um, perform uh, tasks that typically require human intelligence. And machine learning is a subset of, the, of um, AI that um, uses statistical methods that can learn and improve from experience. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning that um, filters the data through a lot of layers to predict and classify information. And most deep learning methods use um, neural network arch architectures. And so um, we often refer to deep neural networks. And then there's this other big um, space within AI, which is natural language processing, which has also been used in, in cancer for a long time. It includes things like speech recognition and natural language understanding and language generation, and also um, these things that have got a lot of press lately, um, large language models. So that's things like um, ChatGPT and its friends, right? This is um, the part of natural language processing that uses deep learning um, in generating um, um, and understanding language. So, um, Artificial intelligence and machine learning are, are not new in cancer. We've seen them for a long time, but recent advances have really converged to accelerate activity in this area across biomedical research and specifically in cancer. Um, and those are really the convergence of the development of um, new methods in deep learning and large language models primarily, uh, but also improvements in things like hardware and greater access to cloud computing, right? So the ability to do these large models and then increasing access to large volumes of health data um, and biological data. So both data coming from the lab, the clinic and, and you know, sort of this real world data. So why do we see so much AI in cancer research specifically? Um, I think partly the answer is um, that cancer is complicated and cancer researchers are often early adopters of new tools and technologies and methods, um, both to build things like um, clinical decision models, but also to understand the fundamental biology that underlies health and disease. And I've put this, um, this slide in here to remind me to say that cancer research supported by the NCI crosses this whole spectrum of areas, not just clinical research, but um, fundamental technology development, basic biology, data science, as well as clinical translational prevention, therapy development, behavioral research, the impact of the environment on health and disease, um, and the ethical context around all of that. So the mission statement for the NCI is there at the bottom, and you can see it's pretty um, broad. And I've inserted that bit where it says across the nation and the world because we fund grants all across the world. So um, we know that AI is out there and in widespread use, and it's in decision support tools. It's in the clinic. It's in the lab. Um, and it's being used to make predictions about outcomes and help guide the decision and um, design of new therapies and therapy choices, for example. Um, and now we're seeing increasingly um, more things like this, where um, AI is approved by the Food and Drug Administration to um, uh, be used with things like uh, devices in the clinic um, to make decisions. Um, so there's a huge range of um, cancer AI communities out there that have um, important insights and contributions. Um, and we, the NCI, we've run a lot of um, workshops across the last couple of years around this space to kind of um, get our heads around where the opportunities and the challenges are. Um, NCI sponsors workshops in, in all sorts of areas, um, and this is, um, this is no different. AI is, is across all these areas. So I'll describe some of these in more detail, but you can see they cover a big range of um, areas, including um, really highly focused areas like um, AI and radiology or biology. Um, some of them are much more methodological, like um, interpretable deep learning. And then are some workshops around things like um, ethics. And then some of these things that I'll describe later on um, that we call innovation labs or ideas labs, where we um, bring people together from different disciplines with the idea of um, building new collaborations. And I felt like I had to put in a chat GPT thing here because it's everywhere. Um, and, you know, so even the, the font of all wisdom at the moment thinks that um, cancer AI is generally a good idea here and, and can do a lot. And what's kind of interesting here, right, is that this is ChatGPT version three here. And um, even having been trained when it was a few years ago, it's actually fairly insightful about where cancer AI is now. So um, AI and cancer is growing rapidly, and it's not just in one area. It's growing across um, the cancer research spectrum from understanding basic biological mechanisms up through diagnosis, treatment and development, and outcome prediction and the implementation into the clinic. 
Um, and what you're seeing here is a graph of NCI um, funded grants that contain the term machine learning or deep learning or artificial intelligence in the title. We didn't do the same graph for um, natural language processing or um, or large language models because um, those are uh, specifically the little large language models are showing up here in later years. Um, these are mostly supported through you can you can see this huge increase in the last few years. Um, these are mostly supported through um, what we call investigator initiated research, which is the bulk of what we support, um, but also through some of our big um, uh, programs like the quantitative imaging network, cancer systems, biology, physical sciences and oncology, and then some of our tool building programs. Um, and you can see that um, AI is um, typically not used by itself in, in these applications. It's used with other um, software or other computational methods um, to deal with uh, um, topics across uh, biology and diagnosis and treatment and epidemiology. There's also um, a fair bit of natural language processing um, being used to extract features from things like clinical notes and pathology reports. Um, and um, using AI methods to get things out of electronic health records um, to predict disease response, likelihood of recurrence and survival, et cetera. And there's emerging applications in several other spaces, including um, areas like drug development, drug response prediction, um, radiotherapy planning, biomarker development. And importantly, I think, at least from my perspective, advancing mechanistic understanding of the sort of underlying biological mechanisms behind cancer. So the NCI supports um, AI through a number of different programs, but the uh, one program that has been heavily impacted in recent years here is our Informatics Technology for Cancer Research Program that supports informatics tool uh, development throughout the life cycle of um, tool development from very early methods and algorithm development um, with small grants up through larger grants for um, prototyping and further development and then hardening, um, enhancement, dissemination, right? Because as these tools sort of move out of the um, single lab setting and into broader and broader use, um, the, the need to sort of enhance and, um, and um, harden and disseminate those tools um, becomes increasingly um, challenging and, and expensive. And there's even an opportunity that we call sustainment for those rare tools that um, become in very broad, um, widespread use throughout the cancer research community. And about half of these applications these days are um, in, involve some form of AI. So um, a big challenge for us at the NCI is how to keep track of um, AI. It's everywhere. Um, AI, um, NCI is a very big organization. We support research across this huge spectrum, and we divide up that research sort of based on um, uh, like the the biological scales, right? So biology, clinical prevention, translation, um, epidemiology, that sort of thing. And so AI cross cuts all of those areas. And so in order to kind of keep track of, of the whole field of AI across the NCI, we formed the um, Trans NCI Artificial Intelligence Working Group with the goal of um, assessing our current investments in AI, providing some recommendations to senior leadership, um, organizing kind of topical workshops. And I'll show a couple of those here in a minute. And then acting as a sort of a point of contact or coordination for um, AI activities across the Institute, but also across um, the Cancer Institute with other institutes of the National Institutes of Health, you know, heart and translational research and bioengineering and things like that. And then a point of coordination and communication with external activities um, with the other um, agencies, for example, and um, other international organizations. And one of the first things that we did was try to do a comprehensive look at what NCI was supporting in cancer AI. And that, that graph I showed you earlier, sort of of the climbing um, grant applications was part of that assessment. But we tried to get a handle on what was in that, um, that large number of grants and where the field was going. And this resulted in an internal report that contributed to this um, publication that you can see here by our former um, NCI director, Ned Sharpless at the time, and Tony Kurlavich, who's the director of the Center for Bioinformatics and Information Technology at the NCI, which um, supports kind of our centralized um, IT resources. So the key points in that report, and I'll come back to the coordinated effort part of this that's at the top later when I talk about the accelerator, 
Um, but some of the key points here was that we um, we could do a much better job of leveraging ongoing activities at NCI. We support AI in all sorts of formats, in all sorts of grant programs, um, but there's not a whole lot of coordination across those, those programs um, at the, the level of the AI methodology. Um, we need to create effective partnerships with other institutes, agencies, and industry. Um, we need better data sets. Um, so every time we have a meeting um, about AI, the... Um, the AI specialists want um, more data, better data, AI-ready data, gold standard data. Um, that isn't always possible. And so we also need to um, make better use of the data that we have. Um, how can we enhance existing data sets when possible, deal with the labeling problems, that sort of thing. Um, we need to explore and adapt emerging AI methods that are used in other fields that can be imported into cancer research. Um, you know, there are methodologies, for example, used in fields like astronomy that, that come into the cancer research space because um, finding a cancer cell in a sea of other cells that look almost identical to them is a similar sort of uh, methodological problem to finding, you know, galaxies and seas of other galaxies and that sort of thing. Um, we need to support a range of training and outreach opportunities to diversify and expand AI capabilities across the cancer research spectrum. And we need to provide um, support for focused efforts on um, ethical, legal, and social implications for effective and responsible use of AI in cancer research. So um, some of the challenges to applying AI in cancer specifically, um, there's a lot of uh, use of industry um, platforms and tools out there by cancer researchers. Often those tools and platforms were not developed specifically for biomedical data or cancer data. Um, and so they, they need to be adapted or integrated in different ways. Um, and interpretability of artificial intelligence models is important to build trust um, in their application, trust for clinicians and patients and um, trust for biologists. And um, the logic um, underlying those uh, models, um, trying to get at the mechanisms um, that they identify um, and discern biological insights, for example. And then um, we need to deal with the, the data situation, right? Applying AI to cancer research requires methods that can handle longitudinal data. We have some big long data sets. Um, they are often you know, um, full, full of gaps or holes or they're incomplete or imperfect in various ways. Um, cancer data is inherently multimodal. Cancer is a multi-scale problem with data coming in from all sorts of different methods um, being collected in all sorts of different formats at all sorts of biological scales. And the data can sometimes be noisy and there's bias in the data and there's bias in the, uh, the way that the data has been um, collected and applied in some cases. And then there's obviously patient um, data and privacy issues. So um, starting to address the, the data problem, um, we held a recent workshop on computational approaches to addressing imperfect data. And this was us bringing together a group of um, cancer AI researchers to talk about what to do when you can't just generate new data, right? We, you know, what can we do with the data that, um, that we have? And you know, where are there sort of strategic gaps that we could fill in, but what do we do about you know, while we wait for the next 30 years to collect the perfect data set, that sort of thing. And so um, to address some of these um, challenges, um, we brought together uh, this set of people here um, the chaired by um, Caroline Uller from MIT and Olivia Gebert from Stanford. Um, and then we organized the workshop into the sessions that you see here. They're organized sort of by biological scale. And we, we went round and round about how to organize this, right? Because AI methods cut across scales um, and they cut across data types and everything else. But, um, the most convenient way to organize the talks was around sort of scales. Um, and so that the, the categories were um, integrating classical structure prediction with machine learning towards drug discovery and drug identification. Um, and then dealing with the scale of um, chemical, genetic, um, and mechanical perturbations, so kind of the molecular level data. And then a session on um, multimodal learning in data limiting context. So when you get up into that kind of cell and tissue level, um, we often have limited capabilities to collect really large data sets in um, some of those areas. And so how can we make the use of the data that we have? Um, and then making use of large scale unstructured clinical research data. And then finally, um, moving on to improving uh, modeling of real world um, data and evidence data, uh, real world evidence in um, clinical trial design and research. So um, a report is sort of coming out of this and potentially a publication. Um, 
but the uh, the key points I think that were raised in this recent workshop, and, and I should have mentioned on the previous slide, you, the, the link there gives you a link to the um, recordings for those talks. But the sort of the key points for me, at least that came up were that cancer models at whatever scale um, need to handle the multimodal data that's inherent in cancer research. And explainability is really critical in clinical decision models. Again, it's this trust issue. Um, clinicians don't trust a model that they don't understand. They don't trust a black box. Um, we need to explain the answers um, in order to trust them. And patients don't trust them uh, with those uh, in, in that way also. Um, and then there's this enormous amount of interest around generative AI and large language models. Large language models are large, right? Um, but how large do they need to be? And there was a really fascinating discussion around methods um, to make smaller um, generative models um, in strategic ways that, that weren't so enormously compute intensive. Um, we can't collect all the data that we need. Um, and so how can we incorporate you know, um, causality and imputation? And where's the line between imputation and just flat out synthetic data? There's controversy around synthetic data, um, but there's ways to make synthetic data um, statistically relevant. And then we talked about um, having sort of the best of both worlds, um, combining mechanistic models um, with um, uh, data-driven, you know, um, uh, AI or machine learning models. Um, we talked about methods for dealing with um, weak labels or unlabeled data. There are um, strategies emerging out there using some of these language models, for example, to um, figure out the labels for the unlabeled data or fill in some of the the unlabeled, you know, the the lack of labeling on some of the data. And then we talked about whether the um, human in the loop model is always the better model. Um, so a lot of these machine learning models are trained um, assuming that um, if you get the answer that the pathologist or the radiologist gets, that's the answer. And is that always correct? You know, there's some interest in um, looking at things um, uh, differently and thinking about gold standards a little bit differently. And then detecting and removing and, and understanding the bias in the data, right? So most data sets have, have some kind of bias in them, and we need to understand what that is in order to, to mitigate it. So um, this paper that was um, published uh, before the workshop um, illustrates one powerful approach, which is federated learning. Um, and although machine learning has shown promise across um, disciplines, the idea of um, out-of-sample generalizability is, is really a concern. And so Currently, the way that that's often addressed is by um, sharing multi-site data, but centralizing and sharing data across sites when it's sensitive data um, is a real challenge. And so um, federated learning um, provides an alternative paradigm to accurate and generalizable machine learning by sharing just the numerical model updates, not the data itself. And this project um, is a, a particularly large federated learning project, involves 71 different sites across six continents, so presumably um, the continent that you're all sitting on now, um, to generate an automatic um, tumor boundary detector for um, glioblastoma. And glioblastoma is a particularly challenging um, form of cancer because of its inherent heterogeneity. And detecting the subcompartment boundaries um, is a really critical step in doing that. And so this federated learning model um, was, uh, it, it was necessary to use those numbers of sites because the numbers of samples at any given site is small. Okay, so um, this paper also came up in discussion at the um, at the workshop. This one was published just after the workshop, um, raised by uh, Yuri Leshkovic, one of the authors, um, and talking about generalist models. So the um, idea of being able to carry out a diverse set of tasks using little or no task-specific labeled data. Um, so they're built through self-supervision on large, diverse data sets. And you can imagine these generalist models um, flexibly interpret different combinations of medical modalities, things like images and electronic medical records and omics data, and turn that into, um, you know, a, a, like a spoken form of recommendations. Um, and you can imagine trained on multimodal data, reasoned with um, multiple knowledge sources, things like literature, clinical notes, knowledge graphs. And adding to that flexible interactions, um, you know, imagine something like ChatGPT, right? Leading to chatbots for patients or clinicians and interactive note taking, augmented procedures, um, text to things like molecule design, um, bedside decision support, that sort of thing. So, this is a really rapidly emerging um, um, area in the AI field. 
um, in the cancer space. So ethics is on everybody's mind um, with AI, and um, you'll see later some high-level policies and codes of conduct and things like that that are coming out. But um, last year, to begin to understand the ethical and social implications of increased AI in uh, medicine and biomedical research, um, the NIH, so that's the, the larger, or, larger organization that includes the National Cancer Institute, um, held a series of events designed to try and understand the landscape of ethics and AI. And these were open. We had hundreds of people. They were virtual um, in this series of workshops that we called microlabs. So micro meaning, you know, short, not micro, like as in small numbers. Um, and then what we tried to do was sort of get a handle on, are we even talking to all the relevant stakeholders? So in other words, are there whole categories of people who should be weighing in on this who aren't, right? If we, if we NIH advertise things, who sees the ad? If we tweet, you know, who follows us and that sort of thing. And so we wanted to make sure that we weren't missing key stakeholders. Um, and, and so we spent one entire um, discussion sort of figuring out what stakeholder communities we should be talking to that we weren't and um, brought them in on the later uh, micro labs. And then we spent some time sort of thinking out the different opportunities and challenges. And then we spent the third lab um, thinking about organizing and understanding the opportunity space. And what that brought us to was kind of a set of themes here um, that were sort of general um, themes that came out of the um, thousands of ideas that were generated in those discussions. And you can see here a whole bunch of um, themes that we are intending to do things about in, in the research space, um, understanding, for example, the ethical considerations of human AI interaction or teaming, um, understanding what digital dignity means, um, thinking about codes of conduct, um, thinking about how to assess AI products. Um, but the one that was sort of the most popular, and popular here means um, the most number of people wanted to join a breakout session to talk about it, was the one um, in the upper left in red um, called um, thinking about um, AI in biomedical research in a, in a systems way, right? Thinking about it across the entire um, AI data ecosystem. So how does ethics cross all the um, flow of the data ecosystem as data and models and everything move through that ecosystem? And so we chose to focus um, and do a deeper dive on that, um, that particular topic. And so we ran what we call an innovation lab. These are, um, uh, a sort of a much deeper dive with a smaller number of people. Um, we choose about 30 or 35 people from a pool of applicants. In this case, applicants including um, ethicists, philosophers, sociologists, ethnographers, in addition to researchers, scientists, um, AI experts, clinicians, um, and patient advocates. And we, folk, we had this group of 30 people focus for a week on this topic with the mindset of creating a culture of ethical inquiry as opposed to um, focusing on kind of regulations or, or rules. So how can we come at this um, from a, a, an ethical inquiry perspective? And out of this week long came a number of new collaborative teams that formed from these people that didn't know each other before the lab um, from these very different disciplines, forming teams and thinking out pilot projects. And um, we're following those pilot projects and continuing to build some new initiatives and funding opportunities around that. We've given out um, supplements and grants and things in this space. So um, one example of negative consequences of inappropriate application of AI, this is a paper from 2019, so it's you know old in the AI space, right? But um, Ziad Obermeyer and, and others um, in this paper found that um, a commercial risk prediction tool used to identify patients for high risk management programs um, was inappropriately using a proxy. It was using uh, medical expenditures as a proxy for illness. And, you know, at least the way our system works, um, you might think that um, if you're sicker, you're spending more money on healthcare. However, um, unequal access to care means that we actually spend less money caring for black patients. And the authors estimated that the racial bias here um, reduces the number of black patients identified for extra care by more than half because of using this proxy. And so I, I use this as, a, um, as an example of, you know, AI works, but you have to ask the right question of the model. So, even really well-designed AI and machine learning can become inaccurate or unreliable over time due to a lot of different factors. 
Um, subtle shifts over time can cause degradation of the predictive capability of an algorithm, which can um, effectively negate the um, benefit of these types of systems in the clinic. And the goal of this challenge prize competition that was um, run by our colleagues in the um, National um, Center for Accelerating um, Translation, uh, translational, what does the S stand for? <laughs> translational medicine, um, uh, ran a challenge prize composition um, to identify um, and minimize inadvertent amplification uh, and perturbation of uh, systemic biases in AI ML algorithms um, that are used in um, clinical decision-making tools in the development of predictive and social bias detection and correction tools. So um, what they were going for here was solutions that detect and mitigate bias in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning that are used in clinical decisions. And they looked at three kinds of bias and predictive bias. So um, problems in um, algorithmic um, inaccuracies producing the, the wrong estimate or um, differing from the underlying truth, but also social bias. So systemic inequalities in the care and delivery and suboptimal health outcomes for some populations. And then um, latent bias, social or statistical biases that occur over time due to the complexity of the healthcare process. Um, and they have recently awarded um, a set of prizes um, for um, projects in this area. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to the thing here on the bottom. So they, they were looking to um, detect and predict these different kinds of bias, prevent different kinds of bias um, and understand it with the ultimate goal here that I've circled of building trust in the community and among stakeholders. And the issue here is that if we really want diverse data sets, the communities that are gonna contribute that data um, need to trust us um, to do the right thing with the data. And so one of the rationales behind this challenge was to understand the bias, but also to um, build trust in, in the larger community. And so, we know that there are um, large differences um, in things like access to healthcare and um, the social and built environment. And social determinants of health remain a really key factor in health outcomes, um, including cancer. And in this blog post and on, on the NCI website and our very recent relatively new um, national holiday, Juneteenth, um, this is a blog post from a health disparities researcher that highlights those issues among others. Um, but one thing that's interesting about Dr. Davis's work is that she um, combines biology and social determinants of health. And um, what she's shown is that um, specific regional ancestries within the African population um, are important. And this is ancestry versus race, right? So ancestries are important and affect some of the um, differences that we see in outcomes. So population studies show racial differences in um, triple negative breast cancer biology, including a higher prevalence of some of the more aggressive types of um, triple negative breast cancer in African-Americans. But um, that, those studies and that, that data have been built on um, investigations that relied on self-reported race of primarily US populations. And due to all of the um, heterogeneous genetic admixture and biological consequences of social determinants, it's really difficult to tease the um, biology out from the social determinants in this complex heterogeneous um, background that comes under these um, different racial categories, um, racial heading racial category headings. And so her work um, goes back to um, African populations to um, uh, to pull out the, the biology and then brings that back together with the social determinants to um, provide a much more clear picture. Um, from our colleagues in the mental health space, um, I just wanted to share this program called SHARE. Um, which is a cloud-based platform for population science that includes social determinants of health um, data sets designed to accelerate research in health disparities and um, healthcare delivery outcomes and um, artificial intelligence bias mitigation strategies. And one of the things that they do in their program is they have what they call these thinkathons, where they uh, invite groups to um, participate. Again, this sort of idea of building trust within the communities um, from which the the data comes. So um, coming soon, um, I talked a minute ago about um, innovation labs and ideas labs, right? These, these collaboration building things. And I've talked about some of these um, workshop series that we run where we're trying to get um, our minds around where the opportunities are. And so we're gonna do that in, in this um, health disparities area. 
Um, and so, so tentatively titled Embracing the Complexity, Catalyzing Transdisciplinary Approaches to Accelerate Progress Towards Cancer Health Equity. Maybe we can shrink that down a little bit. But the idea is to build on the research um, that is out there in cancer health disparities. There's a lot, a lot of research in cancer health disparities. But we're wanting to cross those silos of, you know, biology, social determinants, and, and um, the various other areas that people have studied parts of this really, really complicated problem. And we've run a number of listening sessions at big um, disparities meetings and um, other gatherings. And what's come out of those listening sessions is that um, health disparities data um, has some, some themes to it, right? There's enormous complexity to the problem. There's knowledge integration issues, and there's, um, there's difficulties with expanded engagement. Again, the trust issue. And so, we want to bring together, again, groups from these um, different research areas and consider non-traditional research approaches and maybe build some new collaborations. And so we're designing a series of virtual events, which will be coming soon, um, to articulate some of the key opportunities and challenges in this um, multidisciplinary um, space of uh, cancer health disparities and, and um, health equity. So um, the, I'm going to switch now to this sort of area of um, the combination of um, you know, what humans do best and what um, AI does best, right? And the combination of um, human intelligence and machine intelligence can be particularly useful. Um, the paper that I'm showing here on the left from Godin's Denniser and, and group um, combined um, an AI model that correctly predicted the difference between uh, metastatic and non-metastatic unlabeled cells, which is a non-trivial thing to do. When, when humans look at these cells under the microscope, you can't tell the difference. They look the same. And it wasn't obvious why these cells were different. And um, But the model could predict just based on the uh, microscopic images of the cells. And so they took this deep learning model and um, went back into it, looked for the parameters that were um, that were the, the strongest and pushed those kind of to, a, an, to an extreme and then created images um, using those, um, those parameters that had been sort of maxed out, right? Um, made more extreme. And when you create these, these kind of fake images um, by using the model in the other direction, what um, now humans can actually see the difference, right? When, when the, the parameters are pushed so far. Um, and what they begin to see is, things like um, blebbing, right, which is little bulges on cells and um, brightness around the edges that might indicate things like um, stiffness changes. And th the reason to do this isn't just that it's cool that you can go back and, and create um, data, but it's this idea that human beings get these aha moments when we look at data like that. And, you know, now we can look at these cells and go, oh, you know, maybe there's differences in the stiffness, for example, and go back in and investigate the, um, the biological underpinnings. Um, and this example, not cancer, um, but an interesting approach from Alzheimer's, um, it's a citizen science game called Stall Catchers, which is designed to enable regular people to contribute to the sometimes really arduous task of annotating um, images from um, uh, blood vessels in brains um, where the uh, blood vessels get that stalled, right? They, they um, in, in Alzheimer's patients, you see these blockages. And sort of annotating where those blockages are and how many there are is really important to um, uh, to understand Alzheimer's progression. And they've tried over the years to make um, AI and machine learning models um, that do better than humans at finding these blockages. And none of the models um, quite ever do better than human beings. And so, um, but when you look at so, so they ran they ran a challenge prize competition and um, and got a number of really interesting models that came fairly close, and so they did another experiment where they combined those uh, models in the form of bots with humans and sort of made teams of all humans, teams of all bots, teams of humans and bots together, and the combination of um, uh, bot and human right so AI plus um, human intelligence was actually the best, um, right? So it beat out the, the groups of humans and it beat out the group, the um, machine learning models themselves. So going back to um, NCI's um, strategies for AI and cancer research, um, we're thinking a lot about how to um, leverage existing programs. So we support, again, a lot of AI across a lot of different spaces and um, some strategic partnerships, um, you know, how can we increase collaboration through some of these um, programs that I just described? 
And how do we develop and maintain an interdisciplinary and collaborative workforce that uses um, AI effectively to advance cancer research? So we're considering what we're calling an AI accelerator, this idea of leveraging across all these existing AI communities that we already support through a number of other programs, building a community of communities, right, with shared interests and struggles, doing something that is a little bit more nimble and adaptive, um, and um, finding a way to provide more agile and, and rapid support and um, and, and understanding, right? Um, something maybe that moves a little faster than our traditional grant mechanisms. And then fostering discussion and, and building out things like best practices um, that evolve across um, fields when people are working on, the, on similar methods. And so um, we've held a, um, what we call a, a visioning meeting around um, a cancer AI accelerator. We brought together a group of cancer um, AI researchers um, to sort of envision what an accelerator would be, right? What would be the thing that would do um, all that stuff that I just said? Um, and so um, through this uh, visioning meeting, we came up with um, a set of recommendations, some mission statements, some um, strategic pillars here that you see here, right? So the mission um, being, you know, the, the very small mission of transforming our understanding and treatment of cancer through equitable development and implementation of AI. So you know, a nice contained mission. Um, and then um, doing that with these pillars of um, people, the workforce, right, data models, implementation, um, compute sources, and um, outreach efforts. And uh, the group also came up with sort of a set of guiding principles. So an accelerator in this space needed to be ethical, focused on the integrity and um, regulatory and training considerations um, for appropriate AI use needs to be inclusive, um, and we mean that in every sense of that word, bringing in a lot of varied perspectives to cancer-focused AI. It needs to be um, dynamic, a little bit more nimble and rapid in identifying and exploring um, these really rapidly evolving opportunities. It needs to be enabling and empowering. Um, one of the issues that came up really strongly was this, um, this need for mentors in this space um, and leadership opportunities to foster the next generation of cancer AI researchers. And obviously we're cancer focused and then um, community driven. So this, this needs to not be a NCI top down thing, but rather a community um, driven, um, ongoing and, and community governed sort of activity. And so what we're imagining is um, the accelerator will have sort of two leads, if you will, right? One from the community and then the other one being us. Um, so we're there for kind of long-term operational leadership from NCI, providing kind of the big picture and the vision. And then we're imagining potentially rotating um, leadership, steering committees, things like that from the um, cancer AI community. Um, people that would serve to, um, you know, on a, on a rotating basis to um, provide leadership and, and scientific insight. Um, and then we are imagining that um, spawning working groups, um, you know, in different areas that people are interested in working on around well-defined endpoints and specific um, goals. And, um, and then some of those working groups leading to um, activities, right? So things like those collaboration building ideas labs or think tanks or, you know, focused workshops um, or challenge prize compositions, right? These, these kind of more rapid um, uh, methods of um, doing work that will augment our um, existing grant researcher uh, portfolio. Um, and so the idea is, um, you know, that out of all of these will come things like promising practices, um, access and sharing, development of um, reliable models, um, models that can be deployed across uh, multiple settings, um, standards, maybe best practices, um, and then methods for sharing um, uh, resources and approaches um, to be most beneficial to um, cancer research and patient care. And so where we're headed with all this um, is a pilot. Um, <laughs> um, that's where we always go first, right? A pilot um, to engage a broader audience through a series of micro labs. And again, micro meaning short period of time, but a lot of people, right? So we will be um, taking this kind of vision that I just showed you all as a sneak peek here and having a series of open uh, micro labs to in the virtual space to discuss it more and um, build some, you know, gain some additional community input. Um, we'll begin to assemble um, this kind of uh, lead and steering committee 
And we're thinking about areas around um, uh, pilot activities that might seed the initial groups. And the, the ones that have come up really strongly, of course, are large language models that everybody's super excited about. And then this idea of mentoring, right? People um, need mentors. If we're going to build the next um, generation AI and, and bring up the next generation of AI researchers or AI um, cognizant cancer researchers, um, we need uh, mentoring um, capabilities. And so um, NCI supports a lot of uh, training. So this is across the whole spectrum of, of cancer research. Um, we provide both institutional and individual programs, um, training programs across all of the cancer research space. And that's run out of the Center for Cancer um, Training. And it's a really complicated um, series of sometimes very specific opportunities. Some are more open than others. Some have things like citizenship requirements, some don't. Um, and the Cancer Training Center is seeing more and more of a need to develop programs that support um, training programs for um, uh, scientists that are, um, you know, developing AI expertise, using AI, um, doing data science, that sort of thing. And they're also experimenting with AI themselves with this um, chat bot that they've um, put on the website to help people navigate this kind of complex um, uh, set of um, training opportunities. So um, I just... Now, just oh, say yeah. that five, five, a five minute warning, Jennifer. Perfect. Thank you. Um, voice from <laughs> out in the ether there. Um, so not all of the training um, that we sponsor happens through training grants, though. Um, I mentioned earlier the Informatics Technology for Cancer Research Program. Um, they have a training network um, that is a collaborative effort of the researchers in that consortium. Um, trying to support training um, in data science broadly um, and um, using the tools developed by the investigators in that program, making it easier for researchers to integrate cancer informatics into their workflows and to use those tools. Um, there's a bunch of activities out there like this that support um, data science training um, for uh, underserved communities in particular. Um, that one in also supports the training of the mentors. Um, there's another area that, that I just wanted to highlight quickly here, which is that um, when we think about training, um, one of the activities that we've been doing more and more is thinking about what we call junior investigators or JIs. Um, all our big programs, I think, um, and this is not all of them, this is just a set of them here, but programs like the Cancer Systems Biology Consortium and the Physical Sciences and Oncology Network, um, that have computational modeling as an integral part of them, um, also um, have training programs either built into them or adjacent to them. And um, one of the things that we try to do is bring those um, junior investigators together, either um, group by group or in a, in a large meeting like this with the idea that the, um, the late stage graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty, right, people that are kind of just in that early stage of launching their careers, um, they need to build out this network. It's an inherently interdisciplinary space, and they um, they have a lot of needs that um, people that work in more traditional scientific fields don't have because their um, research is so interdisciplinary. And so we run these um, junior investigator meetings um, where they can come and and um, uh, develop skills and um, build community and, and build out their networks and their skill sets. Um, and um, one of the sort of interesting high points to those always is this um, idea of working with the patient advocates. So junior investigators and patient advocates working together um, uh, create sort of a two-way street of understanding. And the um, junior investigators in particular, I think, benefit from working with the advocates and understanding kind of contextually how their work fits into a bigger sort of, you know, immediate picture and they become better at communicating their science in a kind of a real world setting. I think this is particularly important for people like data scientists and AI specialists, right? It's really hard work to um, explain. And so working with these patient advocates um, to explain it um, helps them to build out those skills and, and gain funding and things like that. Okay, um, I think in the interest of time here, I'm gonna fly through the policy bit here, but suffice it to say, there's a lot coming down the road um, in the US and I'm sure this is true everywhere else. Um, it is our intention to align with all of these, um, these policy areas around um, codes of conduct and bill of rights and um, this um, executive order that's come out of the White House recently around um, responsible and trustworthy AI. 
Um, we have data sharing um, policies that mean that um, most of the data that we support is um, shared, but it's shared um, in a number of different ways. There are a lot of different um, resources out there, including these um, generalist repositories where people can share data that is not maybe as easy to, um, to share in some of the bigger repositories. And um, there is a large national AI initiative. Um, and I'll just kind of go through this all quickly. I just want to highlight um, the top thing on here. We're developing a set of think tanks around equitable and engaged AI to advance cancer research um, as a collaboration between the US and the European Union. And I will save the um, cancer data visualization story for another time, but it's a fun one. And you've got the website there if you want to go and watch a bunch of um, talks that are conversations between people like game designers and cancer researchers and patient advocates. And I think with that, I will end on questions here. That, thanks very much, uh, Jennifer, for, for a really interesting talk there. Um, we've got a, a few questions. Uh, let me put my video on. There we go. We've got a few questions in the, uh, uh, in the Q&A there. The first one's from uh, Ty of Bagrati. Uh, that they ask, uh, there was mention of AI and language models with uh, regard to interpreting histopathology reports. Uh, can you explain further what's the emerging front of AI in histopathology? Um, can I explain the emerging front of AI in histopathology? Well, so um, so there's there's been a lot of use of um, machine learning in that space, right, over the years, and I. I think if I'm remembering that the one that you're referring to, it was um, there's some some more recent efforts around using these um, language models to begin to um, interpret the data that um, or the metadata that comes along with the um, that comes along with the um, with the histopath data, right? And so this idea of um, understanding the data in addition to um, just building sort of more correlative models. I'm hoping that answers that question. Uh, but I, it's a rapidly emerging space. We see a lot of work in the in the area of histopathology and also radiology. Uh, so there's uh, the, the second question here from uh, Carlos Riveros. Um, is, ha, has the topic of AI uh, can be used to guide, I'm, I'm assuming this is uh, policy, not policing, to guide policy and medicine delivery or estimating the impact of research programs in cancer? Been considered. If you, if so, can you expand on that? So, how is AI used to guide policy and medicine in medicine delivery? Yeah. So, so AI as a guide rather than policy about AI. Um, so, I think we're seeing it coming into understanding. So, in some of those bias um, discussions, right, we're seeing it it coming in as a way to understand using AI to understand the bias that's already in the data and in the decisions that get made um, using that data. And then also, um, um, well, I forget where I was going with the last of that. I'm sorry, it's it's actually late here. So, um, <laughs> but, but yes, um, is it guiding policy exactly? That is maybe a question to ask the, the folks much higher than me in those, uh, that, that last slide that I had there. But we, we can, we'll, we'll bring that up <laughs> in, in, the, in the panel discussion and see if, uh... See if anyone has has input on that. Uh, and there was one question in the um, in the the chat. If if everyone can please use the Q and A for questions, we can we can find them more easily. So uh, uh, the the uh, attendee Z five three one five etc. asked, um, uh, can you explain a bit more about explainability of models? Looks like I'm I'm particularly interested in this. What what do you need to be able to do to uh, explain to a clinician or to a patient? Yeah, and the difference between interpretability and explainability, right? So interpretability being like, do we do we understand what parameters were important and what pushed the model in the direction that it, you know, what it, why did it do what it did versus explainability, which is sort of explaining the answer that it came up with. And I think that probably came up during the um, description of um, maybe Zieta Bermar's uh, work there or whatever. Where um, one of the one of the the reasons that um, to highlight that work where we show that there's um, bias in some of those algorithms is that if you 
don't sort of know the answer or know how to interpret the answer, um, the, the models can really lead you astray, right? They will find an answer. Models will will create a correlation or they will they will create um, categories. And um, without sort of having a context around that and being able to explain it, um, we could be led astray. But also, I think the simple answer maybe to the question is, um, clinicians are, and, and uh, biologists for that matter, are, are sort of um, visual people and they, they need to know why. Um, and they just are not generally willing to accept black box solutions, even when the numbers are good. Thanks. So, uh, Pat, uh, if there are no, if if anyone have in, has any um, questions they would like to ask in in person, please raise raise your hand. There's one, probably one last uh, Q and A uh, question here. It says, <clears throat> it's from Artem Key. I'm a computational material scientist, but I want to shift to AI approaches in cancer research. Uh, and, and I think the upshot is that they would like to get uh, experience in, in training and, and work with other researchers in AI. Um, is, is there, is there a, a way to, how would you recommend to, to go through that, uh, getting experience in AI and cancer research? Uh, yeah. Um, I suppose it depends very much where you are and at what stage of your career you are. But I will say, um, it, it just as an amusing aside, one of the other sort of really up and coming areas that we've been seeing is in material science. And so this combination of material science um, being designed for um, ex vivo cancer models, for example, um, really, you know, being able to um, sort of the build it to test it kind of models. Um, and using AI to design the materials to design the models is a really um, interesting combination. We have a program around um, tissue engineered cancer models um, that uh, is an international group and, and has a number of programs. Um, I suppose, I don't know if I put my email in there or not, but people can reach out to me and I can connect you up with these existing programs. There are often collaborative opportunities with some of these big programs where we give supplements to um, the projects themselves to collaborate more broadly, particularly across fields like that and bring in new expertise. So it looks like there's, for a material scientist, there's lots of, of op opportunity. Uh, opportunity. Yeah, it's an yeah. exciting space. Yeah. So if there, there are no, there appear to be no more questions there, um, th thanks very much, Jennifer, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing you again at the, the end of the, the session. Right, thank you. So it's uh, now time to, to move on and to introduce our uh, second speaker, uh, who is Dr. Yitan Zhu. Uh, he's a senior computational scientist in the data science and learning division of the Argonne National Laboratory and a senior scientist at the University of Chicago Consortium for Advanced Science and Engineering. Uh, his research interests include machine learning, deep learning, cancer genomics, drug discovery, medic and medical informatics. Uh, before joining the Argonne National Laboratory, Dr. Zhu worked in the pharmaceutical industry and hospital organization. For the past uh, 15 years, Dr. Zhu has been working on developing machine learning and statistical methods to integrate and analyze biomedical data for disease research and therapeutics development. He obtained his PhD from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Virginia Tech, and he also holds a master's degree in patent recognition and intelligence systems. So thanks very much, uh, Dr. Zhu. I, I, uh, if you can get your slides up and uh, we, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, good day to the audience. Uh, I'm going to share my slides. I think you can see my slides now. That's all good. Okay, great. So <clears throat> this talk is about the computational prediction of anti-cancer drug response in preclinical drug screening experiments using machine learning and deep learning approaches. I am from the Argonne National Laboratory. Argonne is a research facility of the US Department of Energy. You might be a little surprised to know that a Department of Energy lab is working on cancer research. So here is some background information. 
In 2016, the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. National Cancer Institute engaged in a strategic interagency collaboration to simultaneously accelerate advances in precision oncology and scientific computing. The Department of the Department of Energy wants to use its computational facility and analytical expertise to help drive cancer advances. The National Cancer Institute wants to use its cancer research resources and topics as a use case to help drive computing advances. And the, the DOE and the NCI collaboration is part of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. Our Argonne National Laboratory participated in the collaborative project since the beginning. Um, the we worked with the NCI um, on computational drug response prediction. The collaborative research project is divided into two phases. The first phase is called pilot one because we had three pilot projects at that time, uh, each focusing on a different aspect of cancer research. The pilot one project focused on developing new novel drug response prediction models. The second phase of the project, which we call it uh, IMPROVE, which is our current project. Um, the focus of the IMPROVE project is to develop a benchmark comprehensive framework to evaluate and compare existing drug response prediction models. To support the collaborative research, we also build two infrastructure projects, Kendo and Modec. Kendo is a distributed deep learning environment that we build to support large scale runs of cancer computational models on clusters and supercomputers. Modec is an online platform for storing and sharing data and models developed in the collaborative research projects. Our general research goal for this project is to develop machine learning models to predict anti-cancer drug response to optimize preclinical screening of drugs. The cancer models that we usually use in the preclinical drug screening experiments are immortalized cell lines. Patient-derived xenografts (PDX) and patient-derived organoids (PDOs). We are using the molecular data and the compound screening data of cell lines (PDX) and the PDOs, and also compound information to build machine learning models to predict drug response of drug screening experiments. Then, based on the prediction result we can select the experiments that are most likely to give a responsive result for future experiments. In this way, we can help to improve the cost efficiency of drug screening studies. We take the drug response prediction problem as a function. The input parameters of this function is tumor representation, drug representation, and the meta information if available. This can be um, patient treatment history or other information. Then the output of this function is drug response. For the tumor representation, we can choose various types of data to represent tumor, such as the gene expression, mutation, protein expression, DNA message, or even pathology images. For the drug representations, we can also use different types of data. For example, the numerical descriptors, binary fingerprints, or the graphical representation or smile screens. If the drug response prediction task is dose dependent, we can also input doses as the input parameters. For the output of this function, the drug response, it can be measured by various different efficacy metrics, such as the half maximum inhibitory concentration, IC50, and the area under the dose response curve, AUC. In the past few years, we made quite a few technical achievements, which are pioneering works in this field. We developed a deep learning model to predict the response of drug combinations. This model achieved a coefficient determination R squared equal to 0 0.944 in five-fold cross-validation. 
for the dose-dependent drug response prediction. So the picture here shows the architecture of this deep learning model. It uses multi-omics data of cell lines and drug descriptors to make prediction. Each type of input data is encoded by its corresponding neural network layers. Then the embeddings from the multiple data types are concatenated and then forwarded to fully collected layers with the residual collection to make prediction. We also conducted a transfer learning study for building response prediction models across drugs. In this study, we demonstrated that ensemble transfer learning can leverage the prediction patterns learned on large drug screen data sets to improve the prediction performance on relatively small drug screening study. We also conducted the first large scale learning curve analysis for drug response prediction. We usually call drug response prediction as DRP for short. In this particular study, we showed that with deep learning approaches can outperform traditional machine learning methods for drug response prediction when the training data size is larger than 40,000. We also conducted a comprehensive investigation on model generalizability between different drug screen data sets. In this study, we discovered that the differences in viability assays can limit model generalizability between data sets. For example, if you have two data sets which are generated using the same viability assay, a model that is trained on the one of the data set is more generalizable to the other data set than the case that if the two data sets are generated using different viability assay technologies. In this study, we also discovered that drug diversity is more crucial than tumor diversity in the training data set for raising the model generalizability across data sets. For this talk, I will talk about three of our research projects. The first one that I will talk about is the image generator for tablet data, IGTD. It is a, an algorithm that can convert gene expressions and drug descriptors of table format into image representations. Then we can use convolutional neural network models to model drug response based on the image representations. In the second project, we use data augmentation and multimodal learning techniques to predict drug response in patient-derived xenographs PDX using gene expressions and pathology images. The last project I will talk about is our current project, IMPROVE. The goal of the IMPROVE project is to develop a community-based automated framework to perform large scale evaluations and comparisons of DRP models. Our purpose is to fill the vacancy in the field that there's currently no benchmark or consensus on evaluating DRP models. So the first section is about the IGTD algorithm. Many drug response prediction models are built based on cancer omics data and drug feature data. By default, these two types of data are in table format. Convolutional models have been recently very successfully used in many applications, where important information about the data is embedded in the world of features, such as speech and imaging analysis. Because the convolution kernel and the convolution layers can well capture the spatial relationship of features in the data to facilitate the prediction. On the contrary, tabular data usually do not assume a spatial relationship between features, and that's a lot idea for modeling using CNNs. To apply CNNs for drug response modeling, we develop a image generated for tablet IGTD algorithm to convert the gene expression profiles of cancer cell lines and the molecular descriptors of drugs into their respective image representations, one image for each cell line or drug. 
The algorithm first assigns features to pixel positions so that the similar features are close to each other in the image. Then, as illustrated by the picture here, for each column in the tab tabular data, which is a sample, the algorithm will generate a heat map to represent the sample. The intensity of a pixel in the image shows the value of the feature, of the corresponding feature in the sample. The code of IGTD algorithm is freely available on GitHub. You can use it for your own analysis task. Not necessary drug response prediction because IGTD is a general algorithm that can be applied on any tabular data. I will briefly introduce the IGTD algorithm. The first step of the algorithm standardizes features and calculates pairwise distances between features. The example here includes 2,500 features. We rank the feature distances and give high rank values to large distances. Then we use the rank values to generate a distance rank matrix between the features as shown in figure A here. So this matrix is a 2,500 by 2,500 matrix. The black elements in the matrix indicate high rank values, large distances. Mm. Because we have 2,500 features, naturally, we want to convert them into a 50 by 50 image. The second step of the algorithm calculates pairwise distances between pixels based on their grid locations in a 50 by 50 image. We also rank the pixel distances and give high rank values to large distances. Similarly, we can generate a pixel distance rank matrix as shown in figure B here. It is also a 2,500 by 2,500 symmetric matrix, but it shows some interesting visual pattern because the pixels are concatenated row by row from the image to form this matrix. You can see the top right and the bottom left corners are darker because there are distances between pixels from the top rows and the bottom rows in the image. So the distance are large and the rank values are large. The region around the diagonal oops, is brighter because there are distances between pixels from adjacent rows in the image. So the distances are smaller and the rank values are smaller. And the whole matrix shows a mosaic pattern. The small tiles in this matrix correspond to the cap pairwise combinations of rows from the image. I copied the feature distance rank matrix and the pixel distance rank matrix from the previous slide to this slide. There are figure A and figure B here. Then to assign features to pixel positions in the image, we can simply assign the ice feature in the feature distance rank matrix on the left to the ice pixel position in the pixel distance rank matrix on the right. Then to assign similar features to adjacent pixels in the image, we can modify the order of the, of the features in the feature distance rank matrix so that it becomes similar to the pixel distance rank matrix. To measure the difference between the two matrices, we define an error term to measure the difference. This is basically a summation of all element-wise differences in the two matrices. The IGTD algorithm searches for an optimized assignment of features to pixel positions by iteratively swapping the positions of two features in the feature distance rank matrix to minimize this error. Figure C here shows the feature distance rank matrix after optimization. You can see it shares the visual patterns of the pixel distance rank matrix. In figure C, you see the top right and the bottom left corners are darker. The diagonal region is brighter and also the matrix show a mosaic pattern. Figure D here shows the reduction of error over time. After about 5,000 iterations, the error starts to converge. 
a lot of worthy thing here is when we switch the positions of two features in the feature distance rank matrix, we need to switch the corresponding rows and the columns of the feature, two features simultaneous in the feature distance rank matrix. Then we can use the IGTD algorithm to convert the gene expression profiles of cell lines and the molecular descriptors of drugs into their respective image representations. Figure B here is an example of the cell line images. In this heat map, the intensity of a pixel indicates the expression level of uh, the corresponding gene. In figure C, you see a heat map of a drug. The intensity of a pixel indicates the value of the corresponding drug descriptor in this drug. After converting the cell line expression profiles into images and the drug molecular descriptors into images, we can use the convolutional neural network to model drug response based on those image representations. The flow chart here shows the architecture of this neural convolutional neural network model. It has two sub networks for the input of drug images and cell line images separately. Each sub network has three convolution layers with batch normalization, radio activation, and max pooling. The embeddings of these two sub networks are concatenated and forwarded into dense layers with dropout mechanism to make prediction of drug response. We test the CNN modeling with IGTD images on two benchmark models, benchmark data sets of drug screening, either CTRP and GDSD. We measure the prediction performance using R squared, the coefficient of determination, and we compare the prediction performance to those of four baseline prediction models that are trained on the original tabular data. These include 90 GBM, a gradient boosting machine, random forest, and two deep neural network models. The result here indicates that our single modeling with IGTD images statistically significantly outperform the other four prediction models that are trained on the original tabular data. So we also think about why single modeling with IGTD images can outperform. We think of data sets where the physical relationship between features can be characterized by feature similarity. The IGTD images can better represent the feature relationship, which can be captured by the single model to make prediction. For example, in the drug response prediction problem, the co-expressed genes may work together in the in in one functional gene module that is involved in cancer mechanism and treatment mechanism. This can be captured by the single model to facilitate drug response prediction. In this section, I will talk about the construction of DRP models based on PDX data. So far, almost all existing drug response models are constructed based on cell line drug screen data sets. The, the reason is simple, because cell line drug screen data are relatively abundant. Some very large data set can include more than 300,000 of experiments. On the contrary, drug screen data of patient-derived xenographs, PDX, are usually very small. A few hundred can already be a very good data size. But we all know that the PDX are much better representations of patient tumors than immortalized cell line because they provide in vivo environments for the tumors to grow. We conducted a feasibility study to investigate building drug response prediction models based on PDX gene expressions and passage images. The picture on the left shows the process of developing P PDX models and using them in drug screening experiments. The primary tumor specimen is first extracted from patient. Then the tumor cells are implanted into 
immunodeficient mice, the tumors will grow. And after some time, the tumor tissues will be collected and then implanted into more immunodeficient mice. Then we will have a family of PDX past passage after passage. Mm -hmm. All of the PDX models in this family is derived from the same original patient tumor. And in the drug screening experiments, some mice of this family will be treated by vehicle and used as, as control. Some mice will be treated by a single drug treatment and some mice will be treated by drug pair. For this particular study, we use an unpublished PDX drug response data from the National Cancer Institute patient-derived models repository PDMR. So the PDMR PDX experiments are well designed. They include usually 10 mice in each of the control and the treatment groups. So we can get a very reliable response measurement. The picture on the right here shows the median tumor volume growth curves of one treatment group of one control group and three treatment groups. The green curve, drug B, indicates an effective treatment because it can reduce the tumor volume. And uh, the red curve, for example, the drug C, is a treatment that is not very effective. Based on the tumor volume growth curves of control and treatment groups, we have an expert from PDMR to make a call on response versus lung response. In this data set, the tumor data include gene expressions and pathology images of multiple mice in, in each PDX family. By PDX family, we refer to the multiple mice that are derived, multiple PDX models that are derived from the same original patient tumor. We have gene expression profiles and the whole slide images of 487 PDX models belonging to 96 different PDX families. For the gene expression data, we don't use the full transcriptome data for the analysis. We use the expression values of less than 1,000 landmark genes, uh, which are selected by the Lynx project. The Lynx genes have been demonstrated to well infer the expression variations of more than 80% of all transcripts. For the whole slide images, we had a pathologist to annotate the tumor region of interest on the slide. Then the tumor region is tessellated into tiles and the background tiles are removed. To represent drug, we use the Dragon Virgin 7 software package to calculate the molecular descriptors. Totally, we use close to 2,000 descriptors. They indicate various types of chemical properties, for example, atom types, estimations of molecular properties, topological and geometric descriptors, and many other kinds of properties. The response data are generated by 12 single drug treatments and 36 drug pair treatments. We have close to 1,000 experiments. Those are unique combinations of PDX families and treatments. About 5% of the experiments are positive, responsive. The others are lung responsive. To form the data used in this analysis, we first match the response value in each experiment with the multiple pairs of gene expression profiles and pathology images of the PDX family used in this experiment. Then we performed two data augmentation steps. In the first step, samples of single drug treatment has their drug features duplicated to become a pseudo drug pair treatment. The purpose of doing this is to combine single drug treatment samples with the drug pair treatment samples for analysis. In the second data augmentation step, the samples with drug pair treatment have, dealt, have the positions of the two drugs switched 
to generate an additional pseudo samples. Then all the samples from the same experiment are taken as one treatment group. So the picture on the left illustrated the data augmentation process. For the first exper experiment, which is group one, we have 10 pairs of gene expression profiles and pathologic images. So we have K samples here. And because this is a single drug treatment sample, we duplicate the features so that it, it becomes pseudo drug pair treatment samples. For experiment M, we have n pairs of gene expression profiles and pathology images of the PDX family used in this experiment. And because it is a drug pair treatment experiment, we switch the positions of the two drugs and to generate additional pseudo samples. So the sample size is doubled. You see two n samples here. Then we use a multimodal neural network model, MMNet, to model the drug response pattern. It has four components. For the inputs of features of two drugs, one gene expression profile, and one histology image type. We use the convolution layers from the exception neural network model to encode the histology image type. The exception model is pre-trained on ImageNet data. The embeddings of from the four data inputs are concatenated and forwarded to dense layers to make prediction. We compare the drug response prediction performance of MMNet to those of three baseline model architectures. The first baseline model is UMENet. It is a neural network model, uses gene expressions and drug descriptors for making drug response prediction. It takes the same model architecture as MMNet, but has the fourth component corresponding to histology image tile removed because it doesn't use the image for prediction. The second baseline model is UMHNet. It is a neural network model use, using histology images and uh, drug descriptors to make prediction. It takes the same architecture as MMNet, but has the third component removed, which is corresponding to the gene expression profile because it does not use gene expression. The third baseline model is light GBM, a gradient boosting machine model that uses gene expression and drug descriptors to make prediction. We evaluated the performance of these models through cross-validation and they used three different performance metrics to measure the prediction performance. This includes the measures correlation coefficient MCC, area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, AURC, and the area under the precision recall curve, AUPRC. The table here shows the prediction performance of all the prediction models a character V in the table means a certain type of feature or samples are used to build the prediction model. The last three columns in the table shows the prediction performance of all the models. We include the two more models here, which are UME LED original and UME LED pairs. These models take the same architecture of UME LED but they are trained on not fully augmented data. The purpose of including them here is to compare with the UME LED model, which is trained on the fully augmented data. We want to see whether data augmentation techniques make any difference in drug response prediction performance. The result shows that our data augmentation techniques techniques indeed statistically significantly improved the drug response prediction performance. Then we further compare the prediction performance of MME LED with UMH LED and UME LED. The purpose is to see whether the combination of pathology images and the gene expressions can outperform using gene expressions or 
astrology images individually. Our result indicated that the combination of the pathology images and gene expressions can statistically significantly outperform using pathology images only, but not reliably outperform the using gene expression only. The next project is our IMPROVE project. It is our current research project. Every year, we see more and more DRP models developed and published. The bar plot on the left shows the numbers of deep learning DRP models published in the recent years. They use different software frameworks, among which TensorFlow and PyTorch are the most popular. The bar plots on the right shows the number of deep learning models belonging to different categories. You can, see, you can see they use different drug representations, different cancer representations. The models use various deep learning architectures and schemes. When evaluating the models, the model developers use different evaluation methods and compare their models to different baseline models. So, Although there are so many DRP models developed, you can see there is no consensus about many things in this field. For example, we don't know which drug representation or cancer representations are more predictive. Uh, there's no consensus on what deep learning approaches produce more generalizable models. And also there's no consensus on how to evaluate models and what data should be used for evaluating models. All these observations motivated our IMPROVE project. The full name of the IMPROVE project is Innovative Methodologies and New Data for Predictive Oncology Model Evaluation. Our purpose is to fulfill the need that whenever a new DRP model is developed, it needs to be evaluated and compared with all previous models. So we want to know which models are performing better and what are each model's relative strengths and weakness. This includes the following. For example, we want to determine what aspects of the model formulation, structure, training protocol can make a difference in performance. We want to understand training data impact on performance. We want to determine the types of errors a model is making. Also, we want to evaluate model generalization in tumor space. This is a typical precision oncology application case in which we want to know how well the model can make prediction for a new cancer case that has never been seen before. Then we also want to evaluate the model generalization in drug space. This is a drug development application case in which we want to evaluate how well a model can make predictions for a new drug that is not included in the training set. Also, many models use prior biological knowledge in their modeling process. We want to know whether those models can effectively use those prior knowledge in their modeling process. So our general research goal is to build a community-based automated framework to make massive evaluations and comparisons of DRP models feasible. The improved framework will include a good number of public DRP models for evaluation and comparison. The table here shows the DRP models that we are currently working on. For the current phase of the project, we set up some model selection criteria to include models into our framework. We are working on deep learning models. We focus on general models that can make prediction across drugs. This means the models that can make prediction for drugs that has not, has not been seen by the model before. For the current phase, we focus on only drug models that make prediction for single drug treatment. Apparently, uh, the code of the model is to be available 
And also we require sufficient technical documentation to utilize the model. Currently, we are curating more than 20 DRP models. The model curation step includes many things. The first step is to retrieve the model code, debug it, and test the training and the inference of the model. The second step is to reproduce results in the publication if the data used in the paper are available. Then we need to standardize the model code for large scale runs. We need to restructure code into three modules. Model training for building the prediction model. Model inference for make, using the model to make prediction and the data pre-processing to prepare input data of the model. We need to standardize the input output interfaces of each module across models. So all the models need to accept the same data format. This includes not only the input data of the model, but also the output data from the model, such as the prediction outcome. We also want to make the models compliant with our candle platform by adopting candle parameters and uh, functions. Candle is a distributed deep learning environment that we developed for supporting large scale runs of models on supercomputers and clusters. The last step of the model curation is to generate a synchronized container of the model to further improve the compatibility and the portability of the code. Large scale runs are necessary for using the improved framework to evaluate a DRP model. The reason is threefold. First, we, our improved framework will include multiple evaluation workflows. Each of the evaluation workflows will assess one aspect of a DRP model. Then each evaluation workflow requires run the many analysis runs because, for example, for the cross validation, we need to conduct many times for model training and model testing. Then in each analysis run, we need to do hyperparameter optimization, which still requires many runs for training a prediction model and testing a prediction model. So the total number of times that we need to train a prediction model can easily reach the scale of hundreds of thousands. I include here a screenshot of our improved project on GitHub. It has more than 40 code repositories. Many of these code repositories are the curated DRP models. We forked their code from their original sources and modified their code here. We will implement multiple model evaluation workflows in the improved framework. The first model evaluation workflow we want to implement includes multiple cross-validation schemes within a data set. The figure on the left here illustrates the multiple cross-validation schemes. In each table, the columns are cancer cases. The rows are drugs. The yellow circles are testing samples and the blue circles are training samples. In the first cross-validation scheme, which is a mixed set, the training set and the testing set cannot, can share both cancer cases and drugs. In the second cross-validation scheme, which is cancer blind, the training set and testing set cannot share cancer cases, but can share drugs. In the third scheme, they can share the cancer cases, but not drugs. In the last scheme, which is called a disjoint set, both cancer cases and the drugs cannot be shared between the training set and testing set. The table on the right here shows an example result of another cross validation, another model evaluation scheme, which we call cross study generalization analysis, CSG. The CSG analysis is to assess the generalization of model across different drug screening data sets. 
So in this table, we have five cell line drug screen data sets. The workflow, we are train a prediction model on one data set and test its prediction performance on this data set and all other four data sets. Then the prediction performance will be filled into this table. After the whole table is completed, we can clearly see the generalizability of the models between the data sets. We will also implement a learning curve analysis workflow to assess how the model performance changes with more training data. In this workflow, a model will be trained with multiple training data sets with different set sizes. Then as illustrated by the picture here, we can draw a curve of the prediction error in terms of training set size. So the analysis, we are studying the data scaling property of models. We may discover that some models can improve their prediction performance more quickly than other models when the training set size increases. Another model evaluation workflow we want to implement is the model robustness analysis. The purpose is to investigate model performance in variations of inputs and evaluate its sensitivity to changes in data and the model training scheme. For example, we can inject loads into the drug response data and then observe how the prediction performance drops when more loads is injected. We also want to implement a post-prediction error analysis module in the improved framework. The purpose is to summarize prediction error uncertainty specific to cancer cases, drugs, cancer types, and drug categories. Besides the curating models and model evaluation workflows, we also want need to have benchmark data to support the model evaluation and comparison. We designed a unified data schema to organize data from different sources. For example, a cell line or a drug is always represented by a unique name across the data sets. The flow chart here shows the unified data schema and how the various data are organized and processed. Each block here indicates one type of data. The data type name is on the top with the data fields in the data table shown following the name. The meta information of cell lines is retrieved from Cellosaurus and the CCLE. CCLE stands for the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. Then the multi-omics data of the cell lines is retrieved from that map data portal of CCLE. This includes the gene expression, DNA methylation, copy number mutation, protein expression, and micron expression. We retrieve the meta information of drugs from PubChem, and based on the smile streams, we can calculate the numerical descriptors and the fingerprints of every drug. We obtain the response data of five cell line drug screen data sets, including CCLE, CTRP, version two, GDSC version one and version two and the GCSI. Then based on the viability readouts of multiple dose in an experiment, we can calculate multiple dose independent efficacy metrics, such as the AUC and IC50. The last piece of data is generated by the improved pipeline. These are the data partition files. They specify the samples that should be included in the training set, validation set, and testing set in each analysis run. Then all the data pieces are integrated and matched together to form the benchmark data for model evaluation. So everything in our improved project is open and online. We have a GitHub project to host all the code 
including the repositories of curated DRP models, the model evaluation workflows and the APIs, and also relevant resources, for example, the scripts for data curation and processing. We also have a website to introduce the improved project and the curating models. We provide, on this website, we provide introduction and guidelines of curating models and also tutorial for making models compliant with Candle and the generating signaling container. We have an FTP site to host data used by the improved framework and the curating models. To summarize this talk, we first give uh, an overview of DOE NCI collaborative research on anti-cancer drug response prediction. Then we talk about our image generator for tabular data algorithm, IGDD algorithm, for converting data into image representations for modeling using convolutional neural networks. We talk about the construction of DRP models based on patient-derived xenograph, PDX, gene expression, and uh, pathology image data. Lastly, we talk about our currently improved project to build a benchmark framework for automated and comprehensive evaluations and comparison of DRP models. These are the references used in the talk. I want to thank my colleagues at the Argonne National Laboratories and uh, our collaborators from the Federic Federic National Laboratory, Mayo Clinic, National Cancer Institute, University of Nebraska, Texas Tech University, University of Chicago, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. This is the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any question. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Zhu, for that, that fantastic talk. I, I must say it's it's really impressive to see uh, all the work that you're doing, bringing together existing models and uh, rationalizing them and making it possible to compare them. That that sort of that sort of work is uh, is really useful to the community. And and um, uh, I, I think I'm probably often quite difficult. Is is that correct? Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And it's uh, especially for the improved project. It's a very large. Yeah project we need to curate a lot of models from the public domain and standardize them and run big pipelines on supercomputers so we have a big team working on that probably more than 20 close to 30 people yeah it looks like a lot of work yeah 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 so um looking in the in the q a here there's we have a question from from fred fung he said uh can he ask questions regarding the Candle ECP project, which I came across a while ago? I recall back then I read somewhere which mentioned there were channels of uh, challenges of model parallelism in the Candle project. I wonder how it goes so far. It says, I also remember Candle was shipped as a native build on the Supercomputer Summit instead of inside a container. My second question was, why do you use that approach? So I guess the first question is, um, Uh, what were the channels of model parallelism in the candle pro uh, challenges of model parallelism in the candle project uh, for the candle project the candle project actually has two components the first component is the candle library the second component is a supervisor workflow um, the candle library defines a lot of input output parameters and uh, functions that can be used to uh, to support running a prediction model. So the candle library basically standardizes a model. And then after the model is standardized, the candle supervisor part uh, can automatically submit uh, the models and uh, including their input parameters to run large scale analysis on supercomputers. And it can also actually collect the information output from the models to automatically organize um the the future batches of the analysis for example for the um hyperparameter optimization 
usually you can launch one batch of analysis, then um, you can get the validation loss of the model training to select the next set of for uh, parameters to be searched in the optimization process. Hope this answers the question. And uh, what is the second question? Ah, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, the second question was regarding, sorry, of, of uh, uh, Fred, Fred Fung's from the, the NCI Australia. Sorry, I've, I've got the wrong one. Um, the, they said the candle was shipped as a native build on the supercomputer summit instead of inside a container. Why use this approach? Oh. Yeah, so so the candle workflow does not require a container, definitely not. Um, you, you can just build your Python uh, scripts and uh, the candle um, supervisor, the workflow can take the scripts and uh, automatically to add the input parameters and the point to the data files, and then it can submit a large batch of jobs to supercomputers. The, the container thing is our is a one step of model creation in the improved project, because we want to further standardize everything. And uh, because those models are from the public domain, uh, building a container helps us to standardize things, and we don't want to change anything in the large scale runs. Uh, once we have the code ready. That's the purpose of using container here. Thanks. Thanks very much for that answer. Can I can I just ask myself, um, with your uh, model that, that uses the, the that uses the method to generate the images and you you incorporate information from the uh, the tumor and from the drug itself as it, in it, uh, in an image format, can you work backwards and use the information in the images to uh, provide information about what drugs are effective? Can you back information about the drugs themselves back out of those models? Do you mean uh, once we use the model uh, to make prediction based on the image representation of cell yeah. and drugs, can we infer back which feature of drug is important? That's correct, yeah. Okay, so mm, that's a... That's usually a quite a challenging problem for deep learning model because um, because the deep learning model is very complex, not like the conventional machine learning methods. You can, for some conventional machine learning methods like a random forest and a large GBM gradient boosting machine, you can easily trace back which feature is more important. Um, but recently there are also some methods developed that you can, um, you can examine which feature in the deep learning model can mm, mm, give a um, higher weight than other features for your prediction. Like uh, if I remember the name correctly, lift over or something. Mm -hmm. um, and also you can, there are some packaging that it can help to calculate uh, sharply values of those features indicating the importance of the features in deep neural model. There are some, there are, um, some papers on that. But in, but in general, it's not easy. Yeah, for deep learning models, usually it's not that easy because the model is too complex. Yep. Okay, th thanks very much uh, for, for your presentation today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the Q&A uh, session at, at the, uh, the end of all the, all the talks. So, thanks for having me here. It's my pleasure to give this talk. Thank you. So. Um, it, it's time now to move on to our, our next talk. Um, at the, the next speaker is uh, Professor Jaya Sri Kalpathy Kramer. Uh, she is the Chief of the Artificial of Artificial Medical Intelligence in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Colorado. Previously, she was an Associate Professor of Radiology at Harvard Medical School where she was actively involved in data science activities with a focus on medical imaging. Her research spans the spectrum from novel, novel algorithm development to clinical deployment. Her lab has been actively involved in research in topics related to bias and fairness in AI. Dr. Kalpathy Kramer has authored over 200 peer reviewed publications and has written over a dozen book chapters. So it gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Palp Kathy Kramer uh, for her presentation. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, 
I am hopefully going to uh, share my screen shortly and share some of the work that we have been doing in the air area of medical imaging AI. Ah, that, that looks good. It's on, it's on screen now. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, some disclosures. Uh, as you've heard today and will continue to hear today, uh, we've seen a lot of AI and machine learning being used throughout the workflow uh, of a patient's journey, a cancer patient's journey. From the, the time the patient comes in uh, and might have some symptoms to deciding exactly what protocol is appropriate for that patient, um, there's a lot of work in AI in the use of um, uh, optimization of the image acquisition. So going from raw, raw data in an MRI, for instance, in case space data to the, the final image or from sinograms and CT to the image. Uh, a lot of that is, happens today using machine learning and AI. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, that's where we've seen probably a bulk of the work in medical imaging AI is in that area. Uh, the, the We've heard a little bit about uh, some of the mo molecular markers and other things as well in terms of optimizing treatment response uh, and a variety of reason, uh, um, uh, steps in this process, almost all of which use AI these days. Historically, cancer imaging has been a little somewhat qual qualitative. Uh, if you look at radiology reports, you'll see often sort of descriptions that are really uh, hard to translate into a mathematical equation. So it might say things like het moderate heterogeneity or highly speculated. And it's really one person's het moderate heterogeneity may maybe somebody else's uh, severe heterogeneity, for instance. So these things have been much more uh, qualitative. As somebody once said, a radiology report is an extreme for, form of data compression in that you take images that are many, many bytes of data and you take them and make them one word of uh, or a few uh, bytes of text. So uh, the goal now with a lot of what we do in machine learning is to try to get some of these um, to really get the images and the data in the images to much be much more quantitative. Uh, here's some, some uh, example from mammography. Again, if you're talking, looking at um, what a mass is, there are many things that might uh, distinguish a mass or especially one of concern and things like shape and margins and density are all what um, a mammographer might look, like, look at. Uh, so, the um, the attributes again that people look at are the shape. So things like what what the shape is. Is it the borders irregular? Or what the margins look like? Is it speculated? All of these things have been traditionally used by radiologists to try to assess the likelihood of concern uh, of reasons for concern. Uh, so as we sort of go along the journey in the use of uh, machine learning in um, imaging. One thing that we have seen is trying to quantify some of these things. So uh, how do we come up with numbers that capture the previously described attributes of a tumor? So uh, people look at things like sphericity, which is essentially how, how close to a sphere the tumor might be uh, uh, versus uh, objects on the left had like more are high sphericity versus the ones on the left, which are essentially have a lot more, um, where the borders might be a lot more uh, uneven, ha might have low sphericity. Texture is something else that has been again noted in radiology reports for a long time in terms of uh, having values. So the notion of heterogeneity, um, again, this, this notion of texture has been around for a very long time. And what we have seen more recently is the interest in trying to, again, capture these mathematical definitions of what a tumor might look like on, a, on an image in radiology, for instance. Uh, this concept is uh, called radiomics. And the idea, again, is that there is a lot more information than we, we have been capturing in terms of the data that we get out of uh, an MRI or a CT. So can we somehow uh, quantitatively capture these differences between what might be benign versus malignant nodules? Uh, and and this, this term in, in this context has exploded in um, utilization, uh, as you can see here. 
and it's been used for many, many things and it's continuing to grow. Uh, uh, so the idea with the radiomics workflow is essentially you have an MRI, for instance, of a brain tumor. You might segment the, um, the boundary of the tumor. You might extract some features. You might do some normalization. Uh, and then you essentially capture features that might indicate the shape, the size, the texture, the uh, a variety of things like heterogeneity. And all of these features can be extracted. And then uh, often you do some feature selection potentially and then do machine learning like uh, random forest or whatever uh, your favorite uh, machine learning tool is. Uh, of course, there are challenges throughout this workflow. So for instance, uh, changes in how you acquire the image and how you reconstruct the image can change the appearance of it and the features might not be uh, robust to these sort of differences. How you pre-process the data in terms of how you, for instance, bin the histograms in terms of uh, before you do your feature extraction can be different. If you just uh, have slight variations in the tumor boundary, for instance, again, that can lead to completely uh, a, a substantially different uh, set of features, for instance. Uh, the, the mathematics of the feature extractions can be different across sites, and then obviously the model building. So uh, although Radiomix has had a, a lot of success, uh, there are definitely many challenges. More recently, we have seen uh, deep learning uh, become extremely popular in imaging. Uh, a lot of the things that we used to do in terms of classification and so on that we did with Radiomix very often now, uh, uh, people are using uh, deep learning to do. And some of the applications of deep learning um, here are segmentation. So segmentation is the task of outlining the boundary of a region of interest. And very often that is a a tumor, for instance, uh, response assessment. So is a, is a tumor getting bigger or, or smaller in response to therapy? Uh, radio genomics, uh, image registration for longitudinal assessment, uh, survival prediction, uh, drug delivery. So a variety of things uh, have, variety of pe people and approaches have been applied for um, radiological imaging in, in cancer. So uh, an example of that is, um, glioma. So for instance, if you have a brain tumor, uh, your patient might come in with a headache or some symptoms that might suggest that maybe they should get some MR imaging. There's a fairly standard sec set of uh, images that are acquired. This could be pre and post contrast, uh, T1 images, T2 flare, uh, diffusion, perfusion, and so on. Uh, often a biopsy is done uh, to assess whether it's what kind of tumor it might be, for instance, a treatment regimen is uh, selected and then response assessment is needed to see if the patient is responding to therapy or perhaps a change is uh, necessary. So a lot of the work that our lab has been doing over the last many years now is how can automated tools improve patient care in terms of uh, delineation and uh, detection of tumor boundaries, treatment response assessment, non-invasive prediction of molecular markers, for instance. Segmentation, again, is a very common task uh, that deep learning excels at for many things in, the, uh, in oncology. So segmenting tumors in radiological images, in pathology, um, and, and a variety of different images is another fairly uh, common and a tractable task. Uh, besides segmenting tumors, uh, deep learning and other approaches have been used to segment all kinds of organs. So in radiation oncology, for instance, um, you might want to segment organs at risk uh, in addition to uh, the tumor thems itself. One reason why we think it's important that we have these sort of automated me uh, methods is that there's a lot, lot of variability in the uh, manual contouring. So in, uh, we've, this is the data on the right is from an actual clinical trial where two readers were reading each case and measuring the uh, volume of the tumors. And as you can see in the top left, there's substantial difference even at time point three between the two readings. In the, bot in the graph on the bottom left, you can see at the fourth time point, suddenly they diverged in whether the tumor grew or was stable and so on. So I th again, the, this is not a new uh, <laughs> discovery. We've seen this uh, reported in the literature as well. We've had many studies where we've had multiple raters do segmentation. And if you actually look at their contours, you can see substantial differences. So, so the goal is that if we can automate this process, perhaps, it'll be at least more consistent. So uh, our 
fairly standard deep learning algorithm. Uh, we used it a few years ago now to create uh, tools for doing uh, uh, the outlining of the flare and enhancing tumors and showed that we had pretty good agreement between the uh, what the algorithm said and what humans, multiple humans said. And in fact, the algorithm agreed with uh, sort of the consensus of the humans more than they necessarily agreed with each other. It, the, now that we've had the ability to find the tumor volume at one time point, the question now is, is the patient responding to therapy? For brain tumors, a response assessment criteria has been established uh, for a while now. And essentially the goal there is this sort of uh, algorithm, <laughs> so to speak, a step-by-step -step process in which uh, the tumor burden is assessed. And it, although it sounds uh, easy, this can be a lot of challenges. Um, so the, you first have to find the slice with the largest tumor area. This is done visually. And it can be quite... Um, quite different in terms of even which slice is chosen by the ex different experts to measure. Uh, we were looking over uh, a radiologist as they were doing this assessment and were trying to assess, ask them, how do, how do you select which slice is it that you want to use? And they their description was, we pick the slice that really captures the essence of the tumor. And we were like, how do you now uh, sort of <laughs> write that into a mathematical formula? I want a slice that captures the essence of the tumor. Uh, then we then find the largest measurable diameter. We have to ex exclude necrosis and blood. Uh, we have to find the largest sort of measurable perpendicular diameter. And depending on the shape of the tumors, and especially in something like GBM, which has fairly complex shape, there can be quite a bit of variability in how these sort of assessments are done. You multiply the diameters and then you add this up for the five lesions. And there can be quite a quite a bit of variability in of each of these steps, which leads to a compounding effect. Uh, in terms of the assessment of this particular way of measuring tumor burden, if we ask two, two, two people who are in the same institution who sort of work together a lot, and therefore we ex, uh, expect them to have much more agreement with each other, we find that e even there, there's only sort of moderate agreement between the, the, the raters. So our goal here was now that we have a pretty good al algorithm to uh, automate, automatically segment the brain tumor, can we now um, automatically also get these bidirectional measurements because that's what is typically used in practice. Although there has been a lot of um, interest, at least among the computer scientists, in trying to get the field to move to more volumetric assessment, still what happens in clinically very often still tends to be unio bidirectional measurements. So what, what we again show that we are able to um, assess the change, so delta between time points uh, we, with very good agreement between the manual and the automatic measures. We can also show that our measure of um, automatic uh, Reno measurement is actually better representative of the true tumor volume compared to, uh, for instance, the, the human derived measures. As a related uh, project that we were looking at for brain tumors is the establishment, uh, just looking at imaging, can you say if this tumor is IDH mutant or not? There had been a lot of interest in this kind of approach um, in, for from imaging, what sort of characteristics of the tumor can you assess? Uh, and so IDH seems like a, it is one of the more um, straightforward ways because even humans can look at it and sort of have a reasonable uh, guess as to whether it's you know, wild type of mutant. Not, not perfect by any means, but at least we enough that we think that might be a signal there. So we had trained a deep learning network to uh, essentially find um, a virtual biopsy, as our, our, our student called it. Uh, so whether you have no, the wild type or the mutant, mutant uh, version of the tumors, can you get pretty good results? And we were able to show that we get pretty good results. Uh, once we have uh, the ability to now segment, the question is, can we segment everything? You, you acquire so much data all the time. These uh, uh, deep learning networks, CNNs are really, really good at segmenting tasks. So can we just segment every organ? So can we automatically uh, extract quantitative information about everything that is required? You already have the scan. Why not use it for other things as well? So segmenting all sorts of organs is something that people have been looking at. And there's a lot of interest now in this notion of opportunistic screening. So you, if you're already getting a, a CT scan can you or MR, can you do things like body composition? So can you do 
uh, muscle and can you do fat and can you do other things? And, and there's again, uh, reasons to believe that these can be useful for uh, in, the, in the course of a cancer patient's uh, uh, pro uh, progress. So uh, we've seen things like sarcopenia and cachexia being um, associated with outcomes. So if you are in a position to automatically extract all of these uh, attributes such as muscle fat and so on, maybe you're in a position to then sort of stratify your patients in terms of uh, good and bad outcomes. Uh, switching gears a bit, I was, I was gonna talk a little bit about the work we are doing in uh, cervical cancer screening. Uh, so this is work with the National Cancer Institute uh, with a large team of people doing different parts of it. Uh, we've been working with them on the AI development for the uh, images. So it's a lead, leading course of uh, cancer uh, morbidity and mortality uh, worldwide. Um, and the HPV virus is one of the strongest risk factors for uh, essentially uh, transitioning to cancer. And in many low and middle income countries, the typical standard of care is to do visual inspection after the application of uh, acetic acid. Although this is really not recommended and has been shown to be not as reliable uh, as we would like it to be, this is still something that people continue to do in some parts of the world. So the question is, uh, instead of doing this sort of in a human way that is potentially subject to a lot of variation, can we train an algorithm to do the same sort of tasks? So can you now um, analyze the images of the cervix after the application of acetic acid, look for things like whitening, and can you then do it in the context of a uh, large uh, screening and triage kind of uh, approach? Again, we see that the burden of the disease is concentrated in a lot of uh, Africa and more low and middle income countries, parts of Asia as well. And so the goal again is to try to come up with a low cost approach that can be uh, deployed worldwide, but with a focus in, in places where cost is a big concern. So the, the this is a, a sort of moonshot uh, initiative and it's a um, the PAVE program. And the goal is to have first the self-sampling for HPV uh, testing and typing. So at, at the end of that, you essentially have the highest risk, which is 16, and then you have a sort of stratified risk based on just the um, HPV genotyping. You then, for the, the women who are HPV positive, you might then go on to a, uh, using this um, device, you sort of a handheld device, you get images after the application of acetic acid. You, stratify the risk based on the uh, the appearance of the cervix after acetic acid based on a computerized algorithm and then you combine it with the treatment um, regimen as well. So th this was something that had been uh, studied quite a bit by colleagues again at NIH and they showed uh, pretty early on a few years ago that their the ability to train a deep learning algorithm to do that is actually substantially is quite good and the performance was quite good. One of the challenges, of course, with a lot of these deep learning algorithms that we'll touch upon in a lot more detail is that they tend to have, they tend to work well in the populations that they were trained with. So the external validity can be more challenging. If you train and test sort of in the uh, same data set, even in a set aside sample within the same data set, the performance can be substantially higher than what it might be in an external population. So we heard the pe uh, previous speaker talk about this notion of generalization. And so that continues to be something that is really critical as we think about deploying these algorithms, especially in a sort of uh, worldwide context. So uh, with, I'm sure everyone here is quite familiar with uh, chat GPT and lang large language models uh, and auto ML and a variety of other things as well. So with all of these tools that are coming on board, it gets getting really easy for us to start to create AI algorithms. We have students in our lab, high school students even, who if you say here's some large data set, we have some positive cases, we have some negative cases, um, you have pre-trained networks like from ImageNet, can you go train a classifier? It really is becoming fairly straightforward to do so. Uh, as long as you have annotations data, uh, you can <laughs> toss it all in and out comes the algorithm. Uh, you can ask ChatGPT to write your abstract for you. It does it 
phenomenally well. You can ask it to write your grant, it does that well as well. Uh, despite all of that, uh, there are obviously many issues. And this follow-up publication from the same group at NIH highlighted some of the uh, challenges in terms of essentially going from an algorithm that is the first step in terms of something you're happy to publish to something that is really uh, generalizable and deployable in a robust manner uh, externally. Uh, and, and these are some of the uh, concerns that they had raised in this uh, publication, including reproducibility, external validity, uh, device portability, and so on. And so I'll spend the next few minutes uh, touching upon many of these aspects and um, explored some, some solutions that we've explored, uh, but it's many of these are still open areas of research. So maybe at the end, I'd love to hear from the audience if you've encountered these and what sort of approaches you may have taken to uh, mitigate some of that. So here's a list of some of the concerns that we have faced when we go from sort of a, um, uh, again, transitioning from something that was one publication to something that is really worth uh, deploying when you're really gonna be affecting a lot of uh, patients' lives. So generalizability, models tend to be brittle and do not generalize ac across scanners, populations, disease presentations, and so on. The second one surprised us, model predictions are not repeatable. We have seen actually very little of this in the literature. Uh, so if you have test, retest data set of the same person imaged at roughly the same time, what you really hope is that the algorithm's output is the same. And we found that shockingly, that was not the case. Uh, another area is this concept of a gray zone. So many diseases lie on a spectrum, but we often tend to treat the ratings as binary or maybe ordinal. And how do we sort of think about uh, equivocal cases or sort of an intermediate zone? Uh, often by the, again, because of the nature of how we train the models and the cost function we use, the models can be poorly calibrated. We can have silent fa failures where the models may fail without indication. They can be confidently wrong. Uh, explainability is something that has been raised as a big issue with deep learning models because, again, of the uh, black box nature of these. Uh, overfitting is something that we worry a lot about. A lot of literature is uh, extremely over-optimistic and has results that are often not reproducible. We saw this a lot during COVID times. Uh, there were many, 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 many publications during COVID, most of which uh, had results that were really extremely um, optimistic and not reproducible. And some studies looked at maybe 300 to 400 of the publications and basically said not one of them is really ready for prime time. So uh, it's, again, as deep learning and other methods of machine learning get more popular and really easy to implement, this is something we need to worry about a bit, uh, more than a bit. Models can be biased and this can be in different ways. Um, Again, since you're learning from historical patterns, you can learn those patterns and code and propagate these biases. So it has it, we have to be quite uh, sort of careful about making sure that we assess the models for bias. So the first uh, problem is the notion of this brittleness. Uh, this was from a couple of years ago, but deep learning models often do not generalize well. And very few studies have actually looked at external validation. The data heterogeneity uh, can lead to poor model performance on external data sets. There, there was an interesting work that looked at how the FDA, which is the uh, US organization that looks at um, sort of certifying or uh, getting models um, stamped <laughs> for approval, uh, per, uh, how, how many of them actually use external data sets, how many of them did prospective studies. This is a uh, sort of living document, living website, where as new models come on board, they keep it updated. But you can see that not, not a lot of them have external data sets or prospective validation. Uh, what does that mean for us? If you think about taking pictures of a cervix with different cameras, for instance, you can see right away that the images can look quite different uh, from a sort of visual, uh, visual perspective. And these can be things that are obvious and clearly seen by a human, or it can be much more subtle. 
uh, photographers from <laughs> from the old film days know the differences between Fuji and other film um, like roles. And you, you can tell almost looking at the image which camera type it came from. The same sort of thing happens here with different devices and different camera types. Uh, and, and potentially with different people taking it from different geographies and so on. So one of the uh, questions that we always wonder about is, is the deep learning model somehow normalizing for these differences? We always had been told that the early layers of uh, deep learning networks do things like normalization and sort of um, sort of more basic features. But what we continue to see most very often is that if you look at for instance, a TSNI or UMAP of the features uh, of the trained network, sort of the last but one layer features and separate them into clusters. What the clustering is not the disease that we really hoped it would be, but rather the device. So what, what we always had hoped is that when you see different clusters, it's because there's sort of different clusters in the features as uh, for different disease states. But what we really see is different camera types, different scanners cluster very separately. So often the networks seem to learn the device first and then the pathology second, which means that if you have now a third or fourth device, it may not necessarily sort of uh, work well on this external uh, data set. Here we have uh, the same person imaged on three systems. And we really had hoped that the same person, same uh, image would look a lot more entangled than we see here. So this, this is quite a bit of an issue. Uh, here's data uh, from the cervical cancer screening uh, question, uh, the automated visual examination. So this was a network that was trained with data from one device on, on the diagonals you can see when you train and test on the same device the performance is excellent but when you train on one device and test on the another device the performance is barely better than random uh, that that is very much of a concern because now you have to retrain your algorithm for every device for instance if you did happen to have data from both devices and train both you get excellent performance on both but this notion of portability uh, meaning that if you have an algorithm that was trained on one camera system, one scanner, and you can just use it on a different device, it's not fully uh, borne out quite yet. There are a lot of different approaches that are uh, being considered to do that, uh, but that's something, that's a work that is still in uh, progress. So things that people have looked at is increasing the data diversity, really focusing on multi-institutional databases, and certainly the work that uh, Dr. Pryor and other of his team have done in creating um, systems like the Cancer Imaging Archive, where we get data from multiple, multiple institutions are one way in which we can sort of help the field along. Another thing that I think uh, we really need is a good way of detecting out of distribution. So if you have a trained network and now you have a new, da new data element, or from a new person, a new scanner, we need to know if the algorithm, if that's, that new data element is close enough to the training data that the algorithm is more likely to work or not. If it comes from a completely different distribution, perhaps we need to be extra cautious before applying that algorithm to that, that new data set. We also need better uh, methods for improving the generalization. Uh, federated learning is uh, sort of a different way of getting access to multi-institutional data sets. So instead of having sort of central repositories, perhaps we, the data can stay behind institutional firewalls, but we can still lay, learn a model that is, uh, has seen data from multiple institutions. Because of the lot of concerns about uh, patient privacy and uh, regulations in terms of um, data sharing, this might be a tractable way forward as well. The, uh, one uh, the, are some of the work that we've been looking at is can you predict given a uh, distribution as to whether uh, do you have a good measure of distribution differences that translate to prediction of the performance in the new data set. So if you had data from scanner one and scanner two, and you see a tremendous drop in performance, can you, without having ground truth sort of tell you how well the algorithm is gonna work in this new data set? So there's been a number of different approaches that we've been looking at, but conformal predict, uh, predictions is one way that we can look at for looking at distribution shifts. 
So in terms of an evaluation plan, I think it's really important that we curate multi-institutional and multi-scanner data sets. Uh, we might, as we are developing algorithms, we might want to think about of ways in which out of distribution inputs can occur. And that can be things like different uh, scanner types, different quality, uh, even things like we are expecting a, a frontal image and you get a lateral image or, uh, and are we putting guardrails around that? How do we make sure that the data going into the network is what we expect it to be? Uh, the second question that I wanted to touch upon is this uh, notion of repeatability. So here is our two images of the same person to our eye, to the human eye. They look very, very similar. But on the left, the model predicted is as a normal case, whereas on the right, the model said it was precancer. Uh, we see, so if you plotted the probability of the output of the network as a test retest, you can see we really want it to be along the diagonal, but we see these off diagonal elements that are pretty uh, substantial. Uh, okay, same sort of things. We've looked at it for multiple um, data sets. So we looked at it for cervical cancer, for ophthalmology, for um, uh, x-rays and so on. And in all of those cases, we find that the models are surprisingly non -repeat, not repeatable especially depending on how you train them. So if they were trained as a binary or two, three class classifier with fairly uh, sort of sharp uh, boundaries, this problem is even uh, sort of uh, becomes worse. So one way to think about why that might be is um, this example, this sort of toy example here. So we have a um, set of data points where we have the classes and controls. And you can see that the algorithm has trained a decision boundary between these two set of points. Uh, the, suppose you had a new point, which is the star. It is pretty close to the decision boundary. So when you train the algorithm one time, for instance, it is in the red part of the decision boundary. Now we now retrain the algorithm with, uh, and because many of these things are stochastic, we get a slightly different decision boundary. And now you, maybe the uh, that star is essentially on the on the uh, cusp between the two classes. And yet a third uh, algorithm trained again on the same data set because it's uh, slightly different starting conditions or however uh, sm small differences in the stochastic, stochastic nature of the training process. And now it's firmly in the blue. So we can see how the the probability of the this data point in being one class or the other might flip flop, and and that which is obviously terrible. You cannot have an a algorithm that you can deploy in practice where small variations uh, in how the image looks or uh, will cause the algorithm's output to go from class one to class zero. So one way in which people have approached that is this notion of ensembles. And so by instead of having one model, you have 20 models in this case. So you get this nice smooth boundary. And so instead of saying that the uh, probability of the the star is either zero or one, you, you maybe you say, say it's 0. 0.4 or 0. 0.6. And at least that way, you know, it's close to the decision boundary and you need to be a little more careful about how you interpret the results. So in our case here, we looked at cervical cancer uh, as well as knee osteoarthritis and both for uh, sort of a binary as well as multi-class problem, we can show that if we do something, uh, this, this notion of ensembling, but through this Bayesian uh, Monte Carlo approach, we show that we get much improved repeatability. The, the Monte Carlo uh, approach is essentially, you have a neural network, you randomly drop certain connections during the training process. And so you get multiple different networks that are slightly different from each other, but you also do the same thing potentially at inference. So you now have 20 networks and you take the average probability of the output of that. And, and what we see is that it really does uh, sort of modulate this flip-flopping and gets it much closer to it being much, much more repeatable. So I uh, strongly recommend that when we are thinking about it, deploying these algorithms, we have a data set that where you can really truly look at repeatability and reproducibility. So if it is ethical, uh, acquiring test readers data sets is great. Often uh, if you have ionizing radiation or other reasons, you might not be able to do that. But if, even if you cannot, perhaps you can do things like um, I mean, a lot of this happens uh, as part of the training. You often have all of these augmentations, but really, really sort of uh, explore how to mitigate against that would be helpful. The third problem that I wanted to touch upon was that 
real world is often a continuous spectrum. In the top row, uh, we actually have data from two different use cases, one in ophthalmology, one in radiology, where the same set of images was given to uh, eight or five experts, and they were asked to bin those images into uh, three or four classes. So sort of a mild, moderate, severe uh, grading. And what you see right away is that some people have a lot more red and some people have a lot more green. And this tends to be fairly consistent. So uh, it's probably not a surprise to many of you, but clinicians are not perfectly concordant with each other. They have their own set of biases. Some people are over colors, some people are under colors. And we often see this manifest itself as a uh, in a um, in, in a situation where the uh, like if you plot things on an ROC curve, for instance, you might see that people lie on different parts of the ROC curve. The uh, in terms of the uh, same problem manifesting itself, we've seen this in public data sets where if you have rate of one versus rate of two, you can see they lie on one side or the other of the diagonal. The, so in addition to raters being sort of along a spectrum, the disease itself can be along a spectrum. And if you don't respect that nature of the disease and try to say everything is binary, perhaps you uh, run into this issue of flip-flopping and grave errors. So for instance, in the cervical cancer situation we have, uh, where we have sort of normal and uh, pre-cancer, uh, we can see a lot of grave errors in the off-diagonal elements by introducing an, a sort of intermediate gray zone class, for instance, we can see that we have a, um, a little more uh, fewer grave errors. And so more things that lie on the, uh, on, on the diagonal. Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, So a, a different solution that we've also considered is this notion of instead of having binary outputs, having a continuous output variable as a function of severity of disease. So in terms of an evaluation plan, I think it's helpful to have uh, multiple raters. We see this quite commonly requested when we are publishing um, uh, deep learning uh, manuscripts that are using humans as the ground truth. Uh, it'd be really good to also have data sets that are along the uh, disease spectrum, so not just the most extreme cases, and then looking at more nuanced cases and seeing how well the model works. Uh, problem number four that we want to touch upon is this notion of silent failures. Very often, uh, for instance, when we're looking at a dice score of a tumor, for instance, what we see is that it has a long tail. People typically report the median or mean uh, value, but really rarely talk about this long tail where the algorithm completely failed. It might be a small uh, minority of cases, but uh, the problem is that you don't know without ground truth which of those cases that might be that failed. So trying to come up with ways of um, establishing the uncertainty when the model is more doubtful for it saying, uh, I'm not going to make an ad, I'm not going to say anything here might be better than it's being confidently wrong, which is often something that we see. So again, Monte Carlo type approaches or other approaches uh, allow you to get uh, identify the cases potentially where human oversight may be uh, necessary, or at least you should be very careful about using the output of the algorithm. They can also improve calibration. Uh, calibration is often not shared in publications, at least in uh, earlier stages of the radiology uh, deep learning <laughs> publications. Calibration curves are not shared that often. It's starting to uh, people are starting to use them more often, and really trying to figure out how how well calibrated the models are is really important. Uh, the, this is a fairly recent publication, actually, from just earlier this year, saying there's no such thing as a validated prediction model. And there are many reasons for that. Patient populations might vary. The uh, So basically all of the kinds of covariate, covariate shifts or label shifts or things like that can cause the association between the model's output and the, um, the input to change over time as well. So I think the, the sort of take home message is we really need to 
understand model calibration. We need to continuously monitor the model performance, uh, get a good sense of what are the characteristics of failures, are there sort of attributes that might predict, help us understand what are the failure cases. And the next problem I want to touch upon is this notion of uh, overfitting. So we see a lot of uh, uh, publications where <laughs> we see, um, again, overly optimistic results. And we did a um, look through some of the publications in the literature. We randomly sampled 50 of them and looked through the kinds of mistakes that people often do. Uh, a lot of it was for the more radio mixed type approaches, but the same sort of thing happens with deep learning as well. So for instance, uh, if you are not very careful about how you split your training data from the test data, uh, and where you do that, there's a leakage that can occur. And often what people tend to do is do feature extraction first, for instance, before doing the splitting. And that if you do that, then again, that's one way in which um, uh, uh, leakage happens. So here were some of the things that we found in terms of uh, what we call sort of mistakes. Uh, so in terms of are you using, not have, do you not have an external data set? Do you... Um, are you doing hyper when and where and how are you doing your hyperparameter uh, selection? Are you using your test data in any way for that? Are you doing any kind of, are you using your test data to inform any part of the model building, model evaluation, except the sort of the very final part? And what we show is that if we, many of these mistakes sort of compound and essentially using a random feature set. So what we did is took real data from TCIA, two data sets, and we had essentially random features generated with true outcomes and showed that we were able to associate these random features with the true outcomes by doing all these uh, mistakes and going from essentially a random uh, AUC to perfect AUC, essentially, by doing all of these things. And so we then looked to the literature and found that many of these mistakes happen more frequently than we'd like to admit. Uh, and again, we showed that you can essentially go from really good performance to random performance as you get rid of your mistakes. So really important to have uh, statistical rigor throughout the process. So a lot of things to think about. Uh, above all, have a statistician on your team who is um, really working with you and understanding ways in which data leakage and other things can happen. Uh, are you doing multiple testing? Are you, is there an external data set and so on? And, and this is one of my favorite uh, XKCD comics. Uh, we've seen this, I'm sure, uh, but basically you can keep testing till you find an answer that you like. And that's what it often seems like happens in the literature, uh, unfortunately. The next topic I want to touch upon is this notion of uh, black boxes. So deep learning models are often considered to be black boxes in the sense that you have an input, something magical happens inside and you have an output. Uh, there are many methods people have used, post hoc methods such as uh, grad cams or saliency map approaches. And um, this is fairly common in the literature and radiology. Uh, the another, one reason in which this has been helpful is that these things have for instance, highlighted things like markers. So what it turned out was the, the uh, deep learning network was not really looking at the lungs when it was trying to recognize pneumonia, but it was actually looking to see for a marker in the, uh, in the shoulder that might indicate whether the patient was taken in a prone position or supine position, which might, uh, or a uh, uh, portable x-ray versus uh, not portable x-ray, which might say how sick, sick the patient was. So there's this notion of shortcuts and the concern often is that we are learning shortcuts and not sort of true associations. So people have tried to use uh, these kind of approaches to see what the model is looking at, if it's truly looking at the area where it should be. On the other hand, there's been a pretty strong uh, reaction from some people in the community saying that if you're going to use these black box models, really don't try to use these post hoc explanations. And this is the bottom one is a more recent uh, publication that again, highlighted what they say, the false hope of uh, explainable AI approaches. So uh, one way to potentially think about that is can you do, uh, develop inherently more explainable model? So instead of just saying positive or negative on a sort of patient level, can you say, here's an area of concern. Anytime we work with clinicians, not just for cancer, but for anything, 
they would much rather sort of have a bounding box saying here's where the model where the model thinks the issue is as opposed to having to scroll through hundreds of images potentially in a uh, CT scan or an MRI to find where there might be something and it can be quite frustrating when the model says yes there's a there's a issue here but not saying where and they cannot find it so they spend they may end up spending more time <laughs> trying to find it than otherwise. Uh, segmentations can be good too. Again, if you have a model that says here's an area and here's um, uh, uh, where it is, that might be useful. So then the uh, so we have a plan that we suggested it might be useful to uh, evaluate how good these saliency or other approaches are. So the first one is do they actually highlight the area of interest? Uh, one concern that has been raised by other authors, and we've reproduced some of that, is that these each time you train a slightly different model, the saliency map looks different. The model output might be the same, but the area I highlighted might be quite different. Uh, or you essentially have a trained model and you randomly uh, change some features, and what you might notice is that the model is not changing. What we really hope is that the saliency map is really associated with the weights of the model and not just things like contrast in the image. So, so here are some things to think about. So, The next thing I want to touch upon is this notion of bias. Uh, there's a lot of concern uh, across many people. Um, we see it all the time in the news as well about the potential for deep learning and other AI models to encode and propagate bias. So this was some uh, work that colleagues uh, put together recently, which is a fairly comprehensive uh, listing and sort of glossary of the different kinds of biases and where they can creep in. So things like data collection, um, model development, model evaluation, and so on. So, uh, and many of them can be in multiple places as well. So, we, so just to say there's uh, five minutes to go. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, almost wrapping up. Uh, so uh, the uh, then we've seen this again. So we've seen that in healthcare decision making, uh, if we use things like expenses as a proxy for health, you can essentially have a biased model. Uh, and, and there's some really good work done there. We've also seen where things like uh, skin pigmentation can lead um, pe people behind. So especially with talking about things like melanoma and so on, we can see that many of these models in dermatology really perform in substantially lo uh, lower performance in darker skin patients. We saw that during COVID uh, when things like your know, pulse ox was quite um, not as reliable again if in darker skin patients. So making sure that the models work for all of the populations in which they are intended to be used is really key here. Uh, this was shocking. Uh, surprising work to many of us in radiology. The Given a chest x-ray, you can train a model to tell what the self-reported race is. And this is, again, no one has quite figured out what is going on here, but many people have reproduced this work and you, basically the model seems to be able to uh, be trained to say, based on a large data set, what, what self-reported race might look like. And that seems to persist even with all kinds of slight alterations. So a low, lower resolution, um, high frequency bandpass or different kinds of alterations and the model is still quite good at doing so. Same sort of thing, uh, looking at your eyes and especially even the vasculature, you can sort of train uh, the models to be pick up things like uh, hidden attributes such as race and sex and so on. One of the concerns is that most of the data used to train models, at least in the US, has come from very small part of the population. Only three states essentially were represented with most of the country not contributing at all. And it's even worse when you think of it from a global perspective. Uh, so we also want to think about this notion of fairness. So how do we make sure that the models are fair, especially when there's a sort of interplay between attributes that we are trying to measure like breast density and breast size and uh, self-reported race and so on. So really thinking of achieving fairness can be quite challenging. There are many different definitions of fairness and that's even probably the first challenge is to figure out what is the definition of fairness that you might want to use in this situation. So some approaches to doing that, again, getting large data sets with more diversity of data is useful. Uh, really making sure that you evaluate how well it works in subpopulations, understand when it's not working and so on. 
We've seen a lot of uh, publications of sort of superhuman capabilities, so doing things that humans cannot. Uh, and this is looking at fundus photos and pre predicting cardiovascular risk or sex or smoking, a variety of other things, or, or telling, looking at a mammogram, who's going to get, get breast cancer five years from now, for instance. Humans are not very good at these tasks, and the algorithms seem to be quite good at it. So given that these algorithms can do things that humans cannot check, and given that we know that they have a potential for being biased, I think what we have to be really aware of is the need for constant vigilance. So making sure we continue to test model performance in all of the all of the populations of interest and really, really carefully looking at uh, concerns about hidden bias as well. So sort of summarizing, uh, here are the things that we think about before model deployment. So what is the reproducibility or portability of the model? Is it repeatable? Do you have sort of guardrails in terms of where you can and will apply, apply it? Is it calibrated? Does it make grave errors? Is it confidently wrong? Or is it a, is can you use sort of the pseudo probabilities to at least warn you that it's not very sure? Is it explainable? Is it biased? It's fair? Sort of how do you monitor it in real life? So uh, with that, I will uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thank, uh, thanks very much for that uh, that great talk and, and uh, a really interesting description of, of the problems with what you might naively think is is an easy task for a for a computer to to look at something and say this is a that's a cancer or that's not a cancer. It, it, it's amazing the complexity of the whole thing. Um, I, one of the questions I have. Um, about this is, is what's the concern if you're running um, a particular, you know, a scan through a screen for, say, breast cancer, and it will miss other things that it doesn't know about that 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 your radiographer would 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 find and say, well, I absolutely, can it, it it is a huge risk. Most of what we have done so far, or what we've seen thus far, has been very narrow. It'll tell you exactly that. You could have a huge bleed, but if you're not looking for it, 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 it won't detect it. Yeah. And that is very much uh, a challenge. And that's why many radiologists think that they're not, despite proclamations, otherwise they're not out of business anytime soon. Um, yeah. Because they do a lot more than one little thing at a time. There are uh, efforts to create more comprehensive tools that will look at more conditions, but they, again, tend to be limited uh, to that so yeah now uh, i was wondering was there a was there a participant who had a, their hand up oh, attendees there is one with their hand up it's uh are we able to to turn uh Ty, tyrav uh, on so that they can speak hi there can you hear me yes we can thank you Hi, uh, Dr. Kalpati Kramer. Thanks for the for the great talk. Uh, my, my name is Dr. Bagrati. I'm from um, South Africa, um, and I just wanted to ask a, a question just regarding the cervical cancer and the imaging parts of um, of your presentation. Um, and may, maybe it's something I'm not I'm not fully understanding. But I, I just wanted to find out how does um, AI truly help advance the field of cervical cancer in the in the future or is this more of a hypothetical training model for for imaging and and then the reason that i ask this is because in, in the diagnosis of um, cervical ca we're we're going to be doing regular pap smear follow-ups for both precancerous or cancerous lesions and even if there there isn't cancer or there is uh, we can detect it quite easily on histopathology, histopathology uh, diagnosing carcinoma in situ, one, two, or three, and even immunohistochemical staining, uh, you know, P67, uh, sorry, P16 or key 67 So uh, do, you, do you see any true application of this in the future, in the in the long term? So, so or... it's, it's a good question, and I think it really depends on which part of the world you are and where what, what is happening and how cost-effective it is. So I think uh, in terms of best practices uh, right now. I think HPV typing is really important. So if you have HPV 16 or these other types that are particularly worrisome, then I think, as you said, there are other ways in which you can assess uh, stratified risk. But 
what still happens in many parts of the world is the the visual uh, assessment of the uh, acetic acid. So essentially, uh, the goal is to help places where that might be still what is happening. And I think the just the visual inspection of the cervix using an AI algorithm does help uh, sort of stratify risk beyond uh, what we have seen. So this the study which is about which is happening right now is actually going to screen uh, 100,000 women over the next like 18 months across the globe. Uh, and they self sampled HPV typing followed by uh, this visual inspection. And so we'll, the goal is to be extremely cost effective. And so we'll know uh, better in a couple of years if this is actually helpful or not. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thanks very much. Um, I don't think we have any more uh, questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll move on. Thanks very much. Uh, Jai three for your, for your great talk, and uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. So our, our final speaker for this uh, in in this group is Professor Fred, uh, Fred Pryor. He's distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics and professor of radiology at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences. Uh, his extensive R&D experience in industry and academia. He focused on the design of advanced medical information management and imaging technologies. Uh, he has had senior management positions in a variety of R&D environments, uh, ranging from Silicon Valley startups to major multinational corporations in the United States and Europe. Dr. Pryor's research interests include cancer informatics, radiomics and neuro, neuroimaging informatics. He is principal investigator and director of the US National Cancer Institute's Cancer in Imaging Archive and is the lead PI of an NCI ITCR team exploring the integration of radiomics and pathomics. So we'll pass the floor over to Professor Pryor and uh, hear his talk. Thank you, Dr. Chalmers. And, um... Uh, that was a kind introduction, and I want to thank the uh, organizers from Inter, uh, Intersect and uh, NCI for inviting me to speak with you today and to enjoy the wonderful talks that we've all uh, just experienced. It's, um, on the one hand, a bit daunting to be um, the last speaker after such great talks, but on the other hand, it is a privilege to, to be here and be able to, to speak with you. Um, as has been mentioned by Dr. Chalmers and Dr. Kapathy Kramer, one of the things that keeps me busy in my research group is the, the care and feeding of the Cancer Imaging Archive, which provides cancer image data and other uh, information to a global research community. Um, so most of my research and my research group are funded by Dr. Couch's agency at the National Cancer Institute. But the work I wanna to talk to you about today actually um, is part of a project funded by uh, the European Union, and um, it's part of their Horizon 2020 program, which is um, exploring a wide array of different aspects of improving our ability to use cancer imaging data through advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence. And one of the deliverables from my work package within that program is tools to create synthetic data. These are tools based on generative uh, machine learning models, most specifically generative adversarial networks. Now, the title of my talk is a bit misleading. I realized after I um, put it together uh, in that I said cancer data, but really I'm a cancer imaging researcher. Um, quite similar to Dr. Kalpathy Kramer. And most importantly, I focus on radiology imaging data. We do work with uh, other data types, including pathology. So really this is going to be generative adversarial models for synthetic cancer imaging data. All right, so if I'm working on a big program to explore the use of machine learning in cancer imaging, why am I synthesizing data? Why, what, what's, what's the rationale here, the, the reason that we're interested in this problem? And the answer is labeled data. 
So um, previous speakers have talked about the problem of generalization of deep learning models. And there's a rule of thumb that I teach my students that came from Ian Goodfellow from um, Google. You're going to hear quite a bit about uh, Ian and his work in this talk. But his argument is, if you want to build a deep learning model that's equivalent in performance to a human, you would, you would need about 5,000 labeled data samples per category. So if it's a classification problem, a binary classification, two categories, 10,000 samples. But to really generalize, and we've heard many speakers talk about the generalization problem, you would need 10 million. Now, if you're Google, that's not a problem. But for the rest of us, that's a real problem. Because predominantly we're using supervised learning techniques, which need labeled data, and we just don't have enough. Even repositories like the Cancer Imaging Archive do not contain, for the most part, enough data to really uh, allow generalization and enough variability in that data. Because remember, to generalize, we have to represent the um, variance in the population that we're studying. In this case, the variance in uh, human genomics and in disease uh, genomics and disease presentation in humans. There are 8 billion humans. That's a lot of variability. So label data is a real problem. And in particular, because in our case in imaging, it's produced manually by human experts who have to say segment or some way identify uh, lesions or make determinations that define the truth for um, both the training and test sets in a supervised learning environment. This is very expensive. And of course, there's not a whole lot of data. So one potential solution for this is data augmentation, expanding the, the labeled data set using synthetic data. And that's not the only form of data augmentation, but it's the one that we're going to talk about because it's what uh, uh, stimulated our interest in generating synthetic cancer imaging data. So what's synthetic data? Well, you, you, you sort of guess from the, from the title that it's data that's artificially created, not generated by from actual events. So it's an artificially created CT scan, not one that was created by actually passing X-rays through a human body and, and uh, reconstructing an image. Now, usually this is done by machine learning algorithms, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. But there are other ways of doing it. Um, some years ago, when I was at Washington University, my colleagues David Girada and uh, David Polite and I did a study where we built a mathematical model of lung nodules uh, for uh, cancer imaging and generated um, a large collection of lung nodules that had uh, well-known characteristics, which allowed us to test a variety of different scenarios. And then we inserted these into real lung CT images that did not have cancer, did not have lung nodules of their own. So we created synthetic data by sort of manually inserting these modeled lesions into real data. That's just one example of uh, other ways of producing synthetic data, and it's uh, rather time-consuming in and of itself. So if I'm creating a synthetic image, the standard for medical images, particularly radiology images, is, of course, the DICOM standard, digital image and communication in medicine. Uh, all major equipment vendors use this standard to represent images. And in general, an image contains pixel data, the, the, the image itself, the picture, and metadata about that patient and about how that image was created that's stored in a DICOM header. So if I'm gonna create synthetic data, one or both of these may be artificially generated. So this is an example of what I mean. This is a uh, synthetic header that was created as part of a project that we were doing with in our European Union program. We've actually created um, many thousands of cases now for the National Cancer Institute, where we uh, identify using the DICOM standard uh, which has a has a, in it a standard for how to de-identify data. So it allows us to identify those fields or do, those data elements in an image header that 
contain protected health information or patient identifying information and need to either be removed or modified in some way. So all the data that you see here, patient names, et cetera, it's all made up, it's all synthetic data. Interestingly, we used to make um, totally invented um, patient addresses and we were working with Google and they actually checked to see if it's a real address, if that ex address exists. So we actually had to make sure that our synthetic addresses were actually someplace real on the planet. Otherwise Google would be upset with us. Um, so we, we generate these synthetic headers and we can also generate the synthetic images. And so this is a, a synthetic mammogram that was generated actually by our colleague, uh, Iman Banerjee at, at Emory University, who we were working with at the time that and we were doing this particular part of the project. And you can see that we can generate not only the image itself with certain characteristics, but also we can embed in it um, what we call burned in pixels or burned in patient and identifying information that would have to be removed by any uh, software that's trying to de-identify this data. Because obviously this patient name can't be allowed to remain in the image. And so, in fact, what we were doing in generating this, uh, these data sets was testing different suites of tools that do image anonymization or de-identification, anonymization in Europe, de-identification in the U.S., according to the DICOM standard, and being able to evaluate those, um, but without having any data that would in any way identify a human being. Okay, so that's, that's one of the reasons for actually generating synthetic data, and there are, there are many others, but I, I wanted you to realize that in fact it contains these two components because it's important for the two to match. If I have a mammogram that was generated with a certain MA and KV, um, that, that will be reflected in the header, and so if I'm creating a synthetic mammogram, I have to make sure that its characteristics match whatever acquisition parameters I put in that header, which turns out to be a rather challenging problem. All right, so why, would I, why do I want synthetic data? Well, I've already introduced two reasons. One is training data for machine learning algorithms where we can expand the labeled data set by, taking, uh, by generating synthetic data where we have inserted known lesions of particular types. I can also expand the data set with specific characteristics that are a limited supply in the real data. So for example, we're, we've been working a lot on screening mammography and uh, that tends to be uh, data that's collected in, in older women. And so the, the breast density, radiographic density tends to be in the lower end of the scale and the higher density are uh, less well represented in the set in the data set. So it's an imbalanced data set. And we're using synthetic data to make that balance. And I, I'll come back to that later in the talk because that may in fact be a problem in and of itself. But that's one of the reasons for, for doing this. Um, I've also I've all, already mentioned that we can generate synthetic images that uh, remove patient privacy concerns. Now we can use this, as I've said, for testing the identification software. Um, it's also been argued that under GDPR, the European Union's um, uh, privacy laws, that this might be the only form of data that is truly shareable, uh, although we've been contesting that, uh, that belief. I, I believe that uh, data sharing globally is really important if we're ever going to build large enough data sets to actually represent the variance in human population. We also use synthetic data to build training databases. So for example, we have a, in our institution, uh, an EPIC uh, electronic health record system. We have a, a, an instance of that that's an exact copy of our real production uh, clinical system, but it contains only synthetic data that we've invented using uh, the, actually the tools that uh, we use to create the synthetic data for the DICOM headers. And so that now this can be freely used by our students. We can use it for research projects and not worry about patient privacy issues. And of course, we use synthetic data a lot as testing data because it can be freely shared. So we're trying to test algorithms. We want data with known characteristics uh, to look at edge cases, for example. So we can generate synthetic 
data for both uh, the text kind, but in our case, in the imaging kind, that allows us to test our algorithms, uh, not just machine learning algorithms, other, but other types of algorithms using uh, data that can be freely shared without worrying about violating patient privacy. Okay, so synthetic data um, to a large extent is built using some kind of machine learning model that can create data. Well, that kind of machine learning model is called a generative model. And generative models um, basically represent data distributions. So this is a, a figure that I borrowed from OpenAI. Um, you see this interesting little shape here. That's meant to represent a distribution of true image data. So each of the data points would be an image, and they they are represented by a data a distribution of some shape. The green distribution. Uh, P of X prime, a uh, uh, hat, sorry, is generated. It's uh, generated in this, in general, mechanism where we start with some source, uh, can be a source of noise or it can be samples from a, from a Gaussian distribution. We run that through a generative model, which is a neural network of some structure that has a set of hyperparameters, which is called theta. And that generates a fake image a, um, a made-up image. And the goal of this process is to compare the loss, the difference between this distribution and this distribution. And we want to minimize that loss so that the fake images are roughly indistinguishable from the true images. That's the goal of, of a generative model. And I've, I'm saying images, but in, in this case, it's very general, uh, generalizable. It can be any type of data. Uh, you can use generative models to create um, uh, text or uh, any other type of, of information, because what you're doing is simply uh, looking, sampling a true data distribution and using this model to produce a, another distribution which is close enough. Okay, so how do I measure close enough? That's an interesting problem in itself because the loss function or measure of distance between the two um, is now a function of distributions and not um, simpler types of, of loss. And so there are specific types of loss functions that are used to compare distributions. I've just mentioned two here. Probably the most common one is the kullback liebler divergence, which is simply a way of measuring how different this P of X and Q of X distributions are. And so this, this would be, in this case, the, the, the measure of that distance or that difference between those two distributions. And that's the loss function. You're trying to then, in, in these algorithms that I'm going to describe, minimize this loss function. Now, there's another class of distances that, that also compare distributions, and they're called the earth mover distances or the Wasserstein distance, in this case, the Wasserstein one. Um, they're, they're called earth mover because you can visualize this as, as the problem of, I got a pile of sand, like here's a pile of sand, and I wanna move the pile, that pile of sand to someplace else. So I'm gonna create another pile of sand, and I, you know, the two piles of sand, I wanna minimize the effort to do that. Uh, so essentially, I'm trying to minimize as some aspect of the distance or difference between the two. The Wasserstein metric, although it looks complicated, actually has some really nice features. Um, when we train a deep learning, or in fact, most any um, uh, machine learning algorithm, we use a process called backpropagation, which looks at the error, the, the uh, loss function, and it distributes that uh, loss or that error to all the weights throughout the network. For a deep network, um, this can be a problem because in order to calculate the contribution at each layer of that network or to each set of weights, you have to compute the gradient or the, the, the uh, derivative. In, in general, these are uh, high dimensional, so it's the gradient. Um, uh, the n-dimensional uh, set of partial derivatives. So you have to compute the gradient of the loss function. Well, 
in a deep network, that gradient can vanish and go to zero. Therefore, there are no contributions calculated past that point. It can also explode, which uh, is an even worse problem. The Wasserstein uh, distance has this nice property that rather than having this vanishing gradient, which is the red line, it has in general a linear gradient. And so um, it minimizes the problem of the uh, vanishing gradients in deep algorithm, uh, deep learning models. So that improves the stability of the model and you know, uh, helps to ensure convergence. So it's, it's uh, growing in acceptance uh, as a way of, particularly for the type of models that I'm talking about, these generative models of um, calculating the loss function. There are many other ways. I just wanted to highlight these two because they've, they focus on this problem of uh, looking at the, dis the distance or difference between two distributions. Okay, so generative models in general, um, there are a lot of them. This is a figure from a paper by Ian Goodfellow from 2016, and so it's therefore quite out of date. Um, but it, at the time, it provided a nice taxonomy or hierarchy to describe the characteristics of generative models. Um, primarily, uh, we're, we're using maximum likelihood estimation techniques, and the, the distribution, the density can be explicitly defined or implicitly learned. Um, one of the techniques that is quite common now and widely used as a, as a form of autoencoder, a variational autoencoder. We're going to talk about autoencoder, autoencoders a bit later because they become important for some models that are not on this diagram. But um, as the title suggests, we're going to talk about this model most specifically, the generative adversarial uh, network. So this is a type of machine learning network that was in fact invented by Ian and his team at Google in 2014. And it is an extremely useful way to invent new data. Uh, the network has two components, a generator and a discriminator. The, the trick here, and the reason that's called an adversarial network is these two are working together, are working against one another rather, they're playing a game in the sense of game theory. And the idea is this network, the generator network, is trying to trick the discriminator network into believing that its fake images are real. So what happens is you train the discriminator using real images and the generator network is, um, has an interesting trick in that it has the ability to create images from uh, some n-dimensional or d-dimensional noise vector. Uh, Previously, I showed you sampling from a, from a Gaussian distribution. It's the same idea here. I'm starting with um, some representation and I'm going to generate an image. Now, obviously, when, you, when I start out, they're not going to be very good images. But the trick is that you train this thing by having the discriminator predict the label, real or fake. Uh, you then calculate the loss function and you, dis and you distribute that loss to both components, to the generator and to the discriminator. So at each step in the training, both of these networks learn their jobs better. And the hope is that the generator network gets a little bit better than the discriminator such that in the end, the prediction is no better than chance. That means you, you've, you've really succeeded and your images are, your fake images form a distribution that's really quite close, i.e. indistinguishable by, by this network uh, from the real images. And so that's sort of the, the key training trick in, in this. And it's just the essence of this game that they're playing is that they're both learning how to play the game better, but you're hoping that the generator uh, gets just a slight edge in the, in the process. Okay, so what do these discriminator and generator networks look like? Well, we've already heard um, uh, in several, from several prior speakers the idea of a convolutional neural network. The discriminator is usually a CNN, a convolutional neural network. And this is a, a deep learning network that basically extracts features at different, uh, a hierarchy of, if you will, or at different levels of granularity or resolution, a set features 
from images. And it does this by using a cascade of digital filters. So convolution means I'm creating, I'm taking a filter kernel, which is a matrix of numbers, and I'm convolving it. That's a process uh, from signal processing, in this case, uh, image processing, that uh, is, a, is a way that I can apply that filter kernel to the image. And in so doing, I'm producing different versions of that image that are filtered in different ways. And what that's doing is extracting features from the image. But what features? Why? How is it guided? And the answer is, at the end of this process, I produce a feature vector, which I, fill, I uh, feed to some form of classifier. In this case, I'm showing a, a, a multi-layer perceptron that's fully connected, and it's generating a predicted result. OK, so we're trying to classify, and in, in our example, and again, Real image, fake image. So it's a binary classifier. This thing then uses backpropagation to train the entire network, not this part which makes the, the uh, classification, but it feeds back to each one of these filters and the weights that it's changing are the actual properties of the filter kernel. So it changes how it extracts features at each of these layers of resolution. And that's, that's the key feature of a convolutional neural network is it can learn the features that are important for making this discrimination, in our case, uh, real versus fake image. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the essence, although there are other ways of doing it, but in general, that's the type of discriminator that we use in a, in a, uh, a GAN or a, gener a, um, a generative adversarial network. The trick now is the part that actually makes up the image. And guess what? It's sort of the inverse of the, of the CNN. It starts with a, what in this case is called a, a code. It's a paper by Radford and all, but it really, it's that um, noise vector. It could also be actually a, an image or um, uh, some source point, let, let us say. And the idea of this, in this particular model, this is called a uh, deep convolutional um, generator network from a deep convolutional GAN. But the idea is it's going to uh, project and reshape this vector into an image of uh, basically the exact characteristics of the image of the real images that we're using in, in our GAN. And it does this using essentially the inverse of convolution, a deconvolution process that's, that is recreating the image. Now, um, there are a number of different types of network that can do this. Uh, I'm gonna talk about an autoencoder in a minute, which has the ability to deconstruct uh, an input, make a latent representation, and then reconstruct it exactly as it was given. Um, if you're familiar with segmentation, we frequently use it, what's called a UNET. A UNET has a, essentially a CNN on one side and the inverse or a, a generator network on the other side. So there are a number of different types of um, generators that are available. This just happens to be one of them. And this is the key trick for generating an output from essentially, in this case, a feature vector. So you've got some representation that you then can use to generate an image. Um, and we actually saw examples in Dr. Zhu's, uh, Zhu's uh, talk, his ID uh, TD model is a generator model uh, of similar type. So there are lots of these. In fact, there's a whole zoo full of GANs. If I can get the slide to project. Uh, again, this is a uh, from a originally from a paper by Ian Goodfellow, but the figure came from uh, arti uh, artificial AI. Um, it was, they had a better version of the figure. Anyway, uh, the idea is that you can construct these in a number of different ways. So this is the one I've already uh, told you about. It's the, the uh, sort of plain vanilla original generative uh, adversarial network. I've already mentioned the deep convolutional network. In that case, both uh, the generator and discriminator are uh, convolutional neural networks, but one is the inverse of the other, as I've already shown you. 
there you can have pre-trained versions of them. Uh, there are conditional GANs that allow you to, to modify the output um, based on certain conditions. Uh, the SYNGAN uses a single training image, but generates lots and lots of synthetic images. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of that a little bit later. And then there's this interesting one, the bidirectional GAN, which uh, basically trains in two, two directions, and it has two generators and two discriminators. And that network actually has another name. We call it a cycle GAN. And frequently when we're when we're training these things, we use uh, paired images, right? So the generator is going to generate a fake image, and uh, that's going to be paired with a real image. Uh, and as we're training the, the GAN, a cycle GAN doesn't have to do that. It just has a distribution of each kind of image. And because of the way it's structured, it's trained a whole lot faster and it can generate a very realistic image translations from one uh, representation to another. So in medical imaging, uh, we can generate an image with pathology from one without or vice versa. Um, and the way this works, it seems a little bit complicated. This is the, the simple picture. You notice it's got two discriminators and two generators. And so this, we sort of expand it to make it easier to see. So we start here with X, it got, it's the original um, source of noise, let's say. We put that through generator G and it, it's evaluated by discriminator D. But we then take the samples that it's produced and run them back through discriminator, uh, through, I'm sorry, through generator, I said discriminator, I meant generator F to produce X hat. So I've got the original X they started with and then another one that I've generated and I can look at the cycle consistency loss and those, what's the loss going through one cycle of this by comparing X and X hat. But it goes the other way too, right? So I can start uh, go backwards from Y through F uh, to produce X hat and then you know, back to Y hat. And so I can do the cycle consistency loss on the other side as well. That's the trick for making it uh, train a lot faster because you're going through this cycle uh, and getting two loss functions, one in each direction. So it's going bo both directions. This is a very, very useful type of, of GAN. In fact, the um, uh, image that I showed you of a mammogram was generated with a, with a cycle GAN. It is. It has another interesting characteristic, though. Um, this is an example from the paper by Zhu. You, you take a photograph of a field with poppies in it, and you, if you train the cycle GAN correctly, you can turn that photograph into a, a rendering as if it was painted by Monet or Van Gogh or Cezanne or Ukiiko. This isn't a problem because nobody's going to buy a fake Monet. But if you're a contemporary digital artist, it's pretty easy for someone to gather up your work, train a GAN and copy your style and then mass produce images as if you would produced them. This has generated a massive number of lawsuits uh, in the courts as I speak, because it's, it's really destroying the uh, field of digital art because it's so easy to copy using tools like this. Now, we're not in the business of creating fake Monets or of, of stealing other people's um, livelihood for, uh, from their uh, creativity, but we are in the business of using this to create different types of images uh, to, to augment medical imaging data. And so that, that brings me back to data augmentation. Um, traditionally, data augmentation is not done with synthetic data. It's done by taking your real measured data and shifting it, rotating it, adding noise to it, and other, some other ways of deforming it so that it increases the size of the sample. In other words, it increases the variability in the sample, but doesn't change the labels. Um, that is still done, it, but now what we're going to do is add to that capability the idea of generating synthetic data using this kind of model. Um, 
so that we can expand the original data set. But we can also change the characteristics of the data. So uh, in this paper by Lee et al, they started with a CT and their goal was to generate an MR. So this is a paired set because they needed truth uh, to train the algorithm. So this is the CT and this is the real MR. They used two different networks. One was a cycle GAN and the other was a UNET, which I've mentioned, but with um, an interesting combination of loss functions. In this case, the L1 plus L2 norm as its loss function. And then they calculated the difference between the synthetic image and the real one. And that's what's shown here. And so what they were doing was looking at how to minimize this loss by varying the model and model parameters in order to generate realistic, I'm sorry, that keeps moving, realistic um, MR images from CT, which is a very, very useful thing to be able to do. What's more interesting to us though is synthetic data with variation. So this is a, a paper um, by Shin et al. in 2018, where they started with data from the multimodal brain tumor image segmentation benchmark data set or the BRATS data set. This was part of a challenge. Uh, this data is actually in the Cancer Imaging Archive. And they also took data from a, an ADNI data set and they're both T1 MRs of the brain. They had a model which, a generative model, again, that uh, infers a, a brain atlas from the MR. So in both cases, they generated a brain atlas. But the BRATS data set also contained models, actually real, of uh, brain lesions. Uh, I think mostly GBMs, but you know, gliomas of some form. And so they had, they could extract those um, mo the model, I'm sorry, the lesions uh, from the original data sets. And then they could modify the lesions. They could either put, use them as they were, or they can shift them in location, enlarge them, shrink them. Simple modifications to expand the amount of data that they get. And then merge those lesions because they've established this uh, consistent, essentially brain atlas uh, model. They can then determine where to put the lesion based on what the knowledge that was in this real data set, they can then take this data, which had no lesions, but insert them. So they, they expanded their data set by, by um, modeling lesions from here and putting them into this data that didn't have it. But then they used a separate um, GAN to go from this label, if you will, to new MR images. So this was T1 to T1, but they also went to T1 with contrast, to T2, to flare. So they generated synthetic images from both of these data sets, starting with the original T1s. Now, not shown here in, in this study, but it's also possible to model the scanner. So you could go from a Siemens T1 to a GE T2 by having the model of the scanner. So you can introduce a lot of variability into the uh, synthetic data. You can change the, the you know, the, um, contrast, the pulse uh, that would be produced by different pulse sequences. You can change the vendor and you can insert lesions, but in a much more systematic way than the study that I mentioned that we did many years ago by manually inserting these, you can actually uh, uh, insert them appropriately, appropriately through mapping these, uh, brain, these atlases so that you have a consistent location. So it's a very nice study to show how you can take um, GANs and generate a wide variety of synthetic data with different variations that are would be important for, um, I don't remember what exactly the study they were doing, but for, in our case is for augmenting data. Okay, so I mentioned our EU project, it's called You Can Image. And uh, my work package, as I said, was responsible for creating synthetic data. Um, this was largely work by um, Richard Osuela at uh, the University of Barcelona and uh, on our end, um, Michael Rutherford and my group. Um, we created a library of um, pre-trained generative adversarial models, including the data that was used to train them, and uh, a set of tools that allow you to go 
to a site that's actually, I, I, I should have put the site here, but um, it's actually referenced in the paper that, that, that's provided. You can go there, it's, uh, Menegan is running, and you can select a model and describe the data that you want to generate. And that model will generate a set of images for you and you can return them. It also has a user interface that if you're nice and have your own GAN that you like and data set that you like to contribute, we'd be happy to have it contributed. We'll evaluate it and then include it in the library. The library um, is fairly extensive and always growing. So this is actually, this slide is a bit out of date because we've uh, added to it since then. We were very interested, as you can see, in mammography. So there are a lot of mammography models because uh, one of our first use cases that we've been working on is mammography. Uh, and so there are a variety of different GANs that are being, that are being used and uh, to solve different problems. We also have uh, some lung data and um, uh, cardiac MR and neuro MR. So not all of these are part of our particular um, you can image project, but we're gathering up models, as you can see, for, that for a wide variety of different uses. And as I said, it comes with the data, so you can use this tool to generate data for yourself online and download the resulting data. So we found that to be a very important contribution uh, for the community, but for us, it's a way that we're actually um, studying this problem of how do we generate real uh, synthetic data to augment the actual data that we're collecting from our five clinical sites and having our radiologists carefully annotate. Uh, so we're expanding the data set using these tools. There's another component of Medigan, which is data visualization and evaluation. This allows you to visualize the results online and actually change characteristics uh, in some cases of the input vector. So you can change um, how the model, that model is working to produce uh, images that more to your liking. It also allows us to have a human expert assess the synthesized data for quality. Now that's one way of doing it. In fact, in general, we have two tier quality assessment for both, um, the generated images as, as well as the um, actual images that we collect. And the first is a human assessment of acceptability. And the second is a metric, a quantitative metric the, of image quality. So in this case, the metric is, has to look at um, the distribution of synthetic data and the distribution of real data. And so we used a variation of the uh, Wasserstein metric uh, called the Wasserstein II or the Frechet um, inception distance, which is another uh, variation on this ability to um, calculate the difference between two uh, distributions. The FID turns out to be a really great way of um, looking at the quality of generated images because it's actually based on a pre-trained deep learning model called an inception model that extracts features from both the real and synthetic images and then fits these to a, di to a distribution, in this case, a multivariate Gaussian and computes the, the Wasserstein distance. So uh, it's a pretty reliable tool for, for assessing the quality of the generated data. Okay, so this is um, where pretty much state of the art is in terms of generating synthetic data using GANs. But that's not the only, sorry, I keep uh, hitting my touchpad. That's not the only way to generate uh, synthetic image data. And I mentioned uh, when I showed you the GAN zoo that there were many other types of uh, models that weren't represented. And one of those is called a diffusion model. This, some people argue, is going to replace GANs entirely. And the idea of a diffusion model is you start with, in our case, an image, and you destroy it. You successively add Gaussian noise in a diffusion process um, that turns the image into 
this latent representation, basically the noise image that you started, that we would start with again. And then the inverse of, the, uh, of this diffusion process is the denoising process, which starts with this and returns um, the original image. That's how you train it. It's trained very much like uh, I've mentioned an autocoder, and I'll show you one in a minute, where the input and the output are the same thing. And you want the input to be as close to the output as, as possible because that's then you've got a latent representation that it's actually contains the information that will allow you to generate the output image assuming this process. And the process is basically a models of Markov chain. So once you've trained this thing, then you can actually feed it these and generate new images. So this is the uh, this is the generator side of this model. And as I said, it's very similar to a very old kind of model called an autoencoder. Uh, this is a very simple version of an autoencoder. It's got one input layer, one hidden layer, and an output layer. And the key thing is the hidden layer is smaller than the input and the output. The input layer is the same size as the output layer, and the hidden layer is smaller. The idea of an autoencoder is it's... Uh, trained so that the input is, matches exactly the output. So in that sense, it's unsupervised because the input's its own label. So you just feed this thing, in our case, lots and lots of images, and it learns a latent representation. Now, these were originally done to, to form image compression, right? Because this is a compressed version of this that will, if you have this side of it, the decoder side will reproduce the original image. But that latent representation contains essentially the complete characterization of the input. So it is a complete feature vector that if you have the decoder can reproduce the input. So it's similar in concept to this, only this is much more complicated, but I'm showing you this for another reason. And that is um, this, text to image models. Now, everyone is familiar with chat GPT, but probably less familiar with its cousin, Dolly. Dolly uses diffusion models uh, to create a new class of algorithms that generate images from text. So this is a, an example, a corgi, the text is a corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet. Boom, you get that cartoon. How do you do that? Well, first you have to analyze the text and to do that you would, use one of these. For example, you have a text encoder that's going to take this text and turn it into a latent representation that exactly replicates it. And it's trained on a large bolus of labels for real images, right? So you find on the internet millions of images and they have labels that say, you know, this is a giraffe in Central Park. Okay, now I have text giraffe in Central Park and I have a picture to go with it. I'm going to use uh, an enc another encoder, this can be, uh, I think they actually use one half of a unit, but um, they're going to encode each of the training images and produce a latent representation of it. The model in the middle, which they call a prior, maps the text encoding to the corresponding parts of the image encoding. And it does this using an algorithm that's embedded in it called CLIP. So the idea of CLIP is I take the latent representation from the text, which is a feature vector. I have the latent representation from the image encoder, which is another feature and vector. And what I'm going to do is maximize the similarity, the cosine similarity between the correct encodings and minimize the cosine similarity between incorrect encodings. So um, that's a that's an interesting trick in and of itself, but essentially what you're trying to do is, is relate specific parts of the text to specific parts of the image. That's in a nutshell what this is doing. And what you end up then when you feed it through this um, diffusion model, you've got a latent representation which comes from the, the um, uh, selecting the output that is the maximum uh, uh, maximized cosine similarity, right? So that's going to generate a, a uh, um, 
latent representation, which you then put through the diffusion model to get it into the right form for this image generator. And it then takes pieces of other images and generates this. So that's pretty cool. It's a great way to make cartoons. And you can, uh, they actually made, um, briefly it was free. Now you have to pay to use it. Um, but it's a great way to, to synthesize lots and lots of graphics. The question is, can it synthesize medical images? And the answer is sort of. So if you ask it to generate an X-ray or a radiograph of the ankle, it does a pretty good job. It does a pretty good job in knees. Notice that this hand certainly grew an extra finger, right? So yeah, like chat GPT, which is notorious for lying, um, Dolly makes things up. Uh, so, but it doesn't do too bad a job with radiographs because they're simpler. However, when you ask it to build MRIs of the heart, I particularly like this one where it's sort of stuck it in the brain, right? Um, it gets a bit lost in more complex imaging. So um, it's not ready for prime time yet as an image generator, but it's a very interesting idea. And you can imagine instead of uh, the kind of text that they might be feeding it, feeding it real uh, characteristics of medical images that you're interested in. So there are a number of unanswered questions in regard to the use of synthetic data. Um, how much synthetic data expansion of our label data pool is really possible and still have a valid output? I mean, am I really representing the variance in the true population by inventing synthetic data? If I only have synthetic data in a given class, will that analysis even be valid? Um, I've mentioned how we evaluate the quality of images, but is, is that quality standard really good enough? I um, mean, how, how well do these things have to match to be of, of true use as uh, enhancements to our la uh, labeled data set. And does synthetic data remove, it, when in training and testing for a model, does it remove bias or does it just introduce a different bias? So one of the ways of looking at this, and this is still an open question, so this, this is not definitive data by any means, but um, the idea is to, um, use data effectiveness as a measure of image quality. And those was the output of my model that I trained with the synthetic data, was it useful? And the study that's referenced here in the in MIT News found that 70% of the time synthetic data was able to produce results that were useful on a par with real analysis. And of course, this is a this is, I'm not in any way related to this company, but uh, mostly AI suggested that their synthetic data, and in this case, it was synthetic data used for uh, anonymization was 99%, uh, contained 99% of the information in the, in the true data. So it's an, another way of evaluating the effectiveness of synthetic data. This is by no means um, the final word, in fact, I'm not even sure I'm still buying this, but because I am concerned about the questions that I've raised, but um, there's at least work being done to try to evaluate the impact of synthetic data as, as training for real models. So in summary, um, deep learning models need a whole lot of well annotated or labeled data to reliably reproduce um, the variance in target populations and to perform clinical tasks. That data is really hard to come by. Even the large public repositories like TCIA and, the, and its companions growing all over the world, uh, we still are very limited due to the cost of labeling it. Um, as I mentioned in our UCAN image project, we have a, a, um, data from five institutions and radiologists from those five institutions working night and day to annotate about 10,000 data sets. Um, that's a monumental task, but um, it's still not enough. We think that synthetic images can be effective to enlarge this training data set, but we have to use them wisely and we have to study the impact of their use on the usability of the model and its generalizability. We also want to use them to, to address class imbalance 
to fill in the gaps in our model. Again, perhaps in bi introducing bias, we hope not. And of course, we can use them to deal with privacy issues because the synthetic data can be freely shared. Uh, one of the cool tricks, as I mentioned, is to generate data with uh, new lesions and of the, uh, particular characteristics, and also to generate data from that goes from one domain to another, like the CT to MR shift. So there's a lot of utility in the synthetic data generation. Um, and of course, as I've identified, there are some risks. So with this, I, I, I'm going to end a little bit early uh, because I think we have a panel discussion coming up and uh, I see that there are some questions. So I'll leave some time for questions and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thanks very much for your, for your really uh, intriguing talk there. And um, it, it's not a... It's not a concept that I'd thought that uh, that synthetic uh, radiography would be uh, so potentially useful. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in in the chat. Oh, let me find where they are. So the first uh, the first says if we consider glioblastoma grade four glioma in brain cancer, which is heterogeneous and a, and in different tumor tissue. In that case, uh, how can GAN modeling be used to generate synthetic data considering the heterogeneity and physics of the tumor growth? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, some years ago, we did a study to try to model um, using, using multimodal MR, um, the heterogeneity of, of GBMs. And basically we built a classifier to classify every voxel in, a, in uh, the brain as to whether or not it was cancer or not. And that, that approach clearly identified the GBM pretty precisely relative to other techniques and to what the radiologist thought, and it identified lots of other regions of the brain. So that's a real problem. The primary lesion, yeah, as long as we have some agreement of its boundary, which is a challenging problem in and of itself, as the example I showed you um, from the literature, you can, synthesize that primary lesion, but the fact that it's invasive and um, we don't really know the true boundary and that other parts of the brain are already infected, no, that's that's not necessarily in the model. At least I can't, I don't know of a way of ensuring that that's in the model. So that's a great question. Thanks. So uh, there's, a, there's a general question here about, um, about sharing the slides from the talks. As, as we've said, all the the talks will be online later, so you'll be able to go back and and uh, revisit the presentations if you if there's a particular bit you're interested in. Uh, there's another uh, question here from <clears throat> Archit Gupta. Thank you for the talk. I was wondering if Medigan can add controlled variations, uh, number of clones, number of subclones, etc., based on user input. If not. Is that something you believe is feasible for a tool like Medigan? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by clones and subclones. Um, it does have the ability, some of the models have the ability to introduce variations, um, but I'm not sure of those specific variations. Uh, we might we might ask if Archit can put his his or his hand up uh, and get more information on that question. Uh, there's uh, Jingbo Wang from the NCI. Um, it would be helpful to have some recommendations on how to generate synthetic data and avoid bias introduced. Any future work in this direction, uh, it can be uh, potentially leveraged to other imaging processing related domains. Yes, um, I, I totally agree. And that's one of, one of the key concerns is um, we're trying to address bias by um, rebalancing data sets, but we're not sure, I don't know that anybody's sure that we aren't introducing new biases that we're not really, that are not well understood. You know, the, the, model, the models are not perfectly replicating um, true images and that imperfection may be in a, itself a bias, or we may be, as I said, um, putting too much synthetic data in that doesn't represent the true variance in that subpopulation, and we just don't know it. So that produces bias. So we're trying to, we're trying to develop 
um, guidelines from our own experience by doing experiments of this type to, to put some boundaries around um, the use of synthetic data and data augmentation. Um, so I don't, I don't have definitive answers yet, but it's, it's again, another one of those great questions that uh, we're working on trying to understand how far you can go with this uh, before you are not addressing bias, but actually adding it. Thank you. And a uh, final question in the, in the Q and A um, says, uh, William Shiring says, I have a lot of cases, but no controls for an analysis. Would using Medigan or another synthetic data set to generate my normal samples be a good idea or not? Yeah, that's, that's again, it's like the last question. Yeah, you can do it. Um, and it would be an interesting experiment, but I don't know whether it would give you uh, valid results or not. Um, the studies that I found suggest that it might, but you know, I can't swear to that because I think that's that is the important question around synthetic data. Now that we can generate massive amounts of it, um, is it really going to help, or does it? Um, in itself cause a problem. So we're trying to use it very judiciously and carefully and then study um, with and without synthetic data. So it'd be interesting for you to try that experiment um, and, and see. Um, what it's, but you also have another, you've raised another important issue that I'll put my other hat on in TCI. It's one of the problems that I keep complaining to the National Cancer Institute about. They only wanna collect images of cancer. Well, that doesn't do us any good without the controls to go with it. We need an equal number of normals. And that's what we're not doing. So if you're in neuro, life is good because there are lots of repositories. Uh, for example, the repository from the um, Human Connectome Project that contain MRs of normal brains. So you can use those. But for most cases, we just don't have a big repository of normal lung CTs to compare for you know, lung cancer. So we really need to build those big repositories of normals for comparison. And we're all tempted to do what the questioner said was, well, let's just synthesize the normals. Um, and that may or may not be a good idea. <laughs> hey, thanks very much. Um, so I th I th the plan now, I think, is to get all of the, um, the, the presenters online and uh, and uh, and open the floor for discussion. Uh, so let, let's see if we can get the others up as well. And I think if if people swap to gallery view, they'll get uh, they'll get all of the all of the presenters uh, so that you can see them. Um, so I, I, I just thought I would pose the general question uh, uh, about uh, artificial intelligence and, and cancer research. So what, what do you see as the panel as, as the real challenges and the real opportunities for applying artificial intelligence to cancer research that that is not kind of you know that, that that's emerging that that's newer and is not not things that are that are done and, and then the the challenges that we face. So let's start with the opportunities. Well, maybe I'll jump in uh, because to me one of the big opportunities, particularly from deep learning models, is what is it actually looking at, and does that tell us anything new about cancer? And so doing studies where I'm trying to take the features of the that I've learned and relate those to um, well, in our case, path, uh, features in pathology images, but uh, underlying biochemical mechanisms to be able to to link the imaging features that are that are learned to real underlying mechanisms. Because in many cases, there are features that we already knew. So we did a study of lung cancer, and when and when we analyzed what it was looking at, for the most part, it was looking at lung nodules. Okay, great, we know that, and that made us feel good. But in other cases, it wasn't. Well, was that bad um, um, model, or was that model trying to tell us something that we didn't know before? So to me, that's a big opportunity, because these things are 
looking at images with different eyes than we do and finding things which may be real and important or maybe not. So do we, so can we, can we learn, can, can we get the AI to tell us something that we didn't know essentially is, is, is rather than uh, things that we, we already have an understanding or, or knowledge of do. Yeah. And just, yep. just that, you know, the odd bits that it points out sometimes that, um, you know, perhaps, you know, um, trained experts overlook, right? Because it's something that you see all the time and you sort of see it as an, you know, an anomaly that's always ignored or something like that. And the, um, the, uh, the algorithm doesn't know to overlook those things, right? So it focuses in on those things. And um, as um, Dr. Pryor just said, going back then and sort of thinking, you know, rethinking some of our underlying you know, hypotheses and thinking about what is that new um, information telling us that we can go back and really dig into the biology and, and figure out what's going on. I think that's a nice opportunity. And one that we're kind of seeing increasingly playing out this sort of back and forth combination approach. Do any of the other panelists have, have comments on that? So I, when, when I ask clinicians what they'd like AI to do for them, I get sort of two extremes of the spectrum. So things that they do, they can do, but it's boring or routine or mundane and do it well and fast and reliably and not get tired and sort of, so we can do a lot more quantification than we do today uh, because the techniques work relatively well. The other end of the spectrum is exactly that, which is things they cannot see. So can I teach them things that they have, that we have not learned yet? So yeah, I definitely get a sort of bimodal response to that question. Yeah, maybe if I could, and sorry to, to, to take two slots here, but- No, no, no. What Ishri just said, I think, um, one of the real things that we can do with AI is to create, in essence, an assay that, that is believable and trusted for screening so that it, it finds all the easy cases, takes out the 80% and reliably does that, leaving the 20% for the radiologist to make a, 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 an intelligent and informed decision, but decision, but based you know, with the knowledge of what the algorithm said, that really reduces the cost of screening and makes it more uh, accessible and, and cost-effective. So I think that kind of tool will be very helpful. So that, that was one of the, the, the things I was thinking. So do you think there, as a kind of excitement for uh, visible AI grows, chat GPT and things like that, that there will be pressure uh, from, you know, administrations and things like that to, to force AI onto the scene when, when as uh, various speakers have pointed out, that that get making making models that are really ready for uh, for prime time is is much more difficult than making a, a research scale demonstration. Do do people see that as a potential problem? Well, does anybody remember uh, Watson? Yep. IBM's big uh, model that was going to be board certified as a radiologist and uh, cure cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, that was a very good model built by really, really good people, um, but it really couldn't do all the things that it was trying to do yet. Although that, that work is, I think, really, really important. ChatGPT, remember, is it's a chatbot. Its job is to pass a Turing test to convince you that it's a human being. It lies just like a human being. So to me, it's not, you know, it's 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 fun, but I wouldn't want to use it for anything except perhaps uh, as a code generating tool because it does actually write pretty decent Python. <laughs> yeah, I want to make a challenge to about using deep learning and machine learning methods in biomedical area generally. So um, in our work, we have uh, a, a strong feeling that the data is not sufficient for using pure machine learning or deep learning approaches for modeling the drug response prediction. Um, even though some data, large data set can um, provide hundreds of thousands of experiment samples for modeling, but comparing to the 
very complex like tumor molecular system, and also the number of um, available drug like compounds like at a scale of millions, these like hundreds of thousands samples are still very small. And so when you try to build a machine learning model, you face severe curse of dimensionality. And but, but although it is challenging, but it is also it also gives some kind of opportunity. So in this kind of case, people try to use uh, say using uh, incorporate prior knowledge into a model so that the search space of the optimization process can be smaller and then you can build a model more relevant to the uh, mechanical understanding about uh, cancer and cancer treatment. Um, but still, I think uh, in this direction, um, more research efforts are needed. Mm -hmm. I'll just, just say to the, uh, to the audience, if you have uh, questions, please, uh, please, please raise your ha your hand, and and we will uh, connect you in to ask a question. So, what are the? Um, I guess it, it's come up and again, um, particularly with respect to to medical data, the the challenges of of dealing with. Uh, getting obtaining data sets and 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 using or collaborating using de-identified data or sharing data and these these sorts of problems. So how close is the cancer AI community to to overcoming some of these problems? The synthetic data is clearly is is clearly one day to, way to do that, but you need you need data to generate your, synth your synthetic data in the first place, don't, don't you? And that needs to come from, from real patients. Well, since I run a data repository, I guess I'll chime in again that um, I think the NIH's recent requirement for data publication, data sharing is really important. And global data sharing, I think, is, is the answer to get large enough samples that represent the actual human population around the planet. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we have a large number of repositories in the US. The Europeans are building repositories. There are repositories now in, in India and a new one just came online in China. So you know, I think this is a really good trend to grow very large data repositories, both you know, I focus on imaging, but they're also uh, equivalent genomics repositories to be able to have the, almost the scale of data that Google has on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's a bit tricky though, right? Because certain kinds of data, you know, um, radiological data and, and genomics and this sort of thing, there's there are clear standards and formats and this sort of thing. And so sharing it and 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 putting it into these large repositories is, you know, I don't want to say easy, right? But it's it's relatively straightforward. Um, but a lot of research data, especially the the stuff that's happening at sort of the cell level or sort of the cutting edge biological research data, um, while it's shared, it's shared in a huge variety of formats and annotated, you know, sort of differently and and processed differently, and you know all the things that happen in research data. And so, um, also having those methods that kind of um, accommodate the now, let's call it diversity of the data sources um, are going to be important on top of the data sharing policies and that sort of thing as well, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not as uh, convinced of shredders as easy as he says to create these large repositories. I mean, obviously, he's done it very successfully, but I think uh, to scale it to the, the level that we need with uh, orders of magnitude larger data sets and especially often what we tend to see is the data shared, uh, either whether it's clinical trial or other things tend to be different than sort of regular clinical data. And I think trying to get more um, standard of care data might also be useful. So we, a lot of longitudinal data is often not, we, we don't, we tend to get snapshots. We don't get as much in the, by way of sort of the entire course of the disease. And there's a lot more, right? Activities, they're sort of, they're, not just the time they went to the doctor, but what they did between visits, all of that, those data would be great to have. I think we're still ways from sort of integrating all of that. So. 
So with that, thank, thanks very much to, to all of the speakers again. Uh, it, it's been a, a wonderful, depending on your time zone, morning, <laughs> evening, afternoon um, uh, of talks. Uh, it, it, it's been very enlightening and I've, 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 I've learned a great deal. So um, just to go through again, thank you specifically. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jennifer Couch, Professor Fred Pryor, uh, Professor Jaya, Jaya Sri Kalpathy Kramer and Dr. Yutan Zhu. And uh, I'll, I'll pass you to, to Sean Smith to say goodbye. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Mei Yun and all of the Intersect staff who've, who've run this session today. So I'll pass, I'll pass you to Sean and he can finish off. Oh, thanks, David. Um... All I can really do is just echo David's thanks. It's been a, an amazing session and you've all been so very generous to, to give your time and your considerable expertise. We appreciate it hugely. So thank, thank you, Fred, Jayashri, uh, Ethan and, and Jennifer. Uh, and thanks also to uh, uh, Mayun and the staff at Intersect who've um, been very carefully managing the recording and so forth. And David, for your, for your moderation. It's been, been, been great. Okay. So with that, we'll see you later and uh, catch you another time, I guess. Bye-bye.